and welcome to all of our witnesses. I am very grateful to uh, my colleague, Senator Durbin, for giving me this opportunity to chair the hearing. And uh, we wish him a very, very speedy recovery. He evidently had knee surgery. Uh, I believe it may have been because of a college sports injury. Uh, and uh, I don't know exactly uh, all the details of his sports prowess. I've seen him in the Senate gym. But uh, all of you know our colleague, uh, Senator Booker, who is truly a college athlete star and very knowledgeable on this topic and a partner with me in longstanding efforts to reform the system. I want to thank our ranking member, Senator Graham, who's been very interested and involved in this issue. And I'm going to put in the record a statement from Chairman Durbin uh, before I begin my remarks. Uh, we all know today uh, that this system of college athletes is in need of reform. Uh, that's why you're here. It's in need of reform now, which is why we're here. The system all too long and often has been exploitive and abusive financially, emotionally, physically. And we have had a number of hearings in other committees, uh, the Commerce Committee, as well as this one. And I am hopeful that this very impressive bipartisan group of witnesses can help to guide us toward specific steps with a sense of urgency that is appropriate for this kind of problem. Uh, the system, very simply, has been far more focused on profits than protecting students, and it has failed to safeguard them against the abusive and often exploitive system that takes advantage of their blood, sweat, and tears in creating a $16 billion industry. Make no mistake, it is a $16 billion or more industry that is fueled by the blood, sweat, and tears of these athletes. And all too often, they fail to benefit from it. Many states have passed NIL legislation. The Supreme Court has ruled in a 9 to 0 decision that has forced, in a sense, a day of reckoning. And I believe strongly that we need a national standard for name, image, and likeness, mainly to protect the athletes against potential disreputable agents or unscrupulous deals in a race to the bottom among a patchwork of states. That's important, not only to protect the schools against unfair competition, but also the athletes themselves. And the idea of a national standard is what brings us here today in a very Im immediate sense. Student athletes are better off now than they were, and many of your organizations have recognized the need for change. Uh, Charlie Baker, the head of the NCAA, specifically outlines some of the reforms that they have taken voluntarily. We've all read and heard alarming examples of these instances of exploitation and abuse. Uh, every year, at least two college football players die of heat stroke. Just three months ago, Mizell Law from Mid-America Nazarene in Kansas was found in the locker room after football practice, suffering a seizure with a body temperature of 108 degrees. Mizell never recovered, and he died a week later. Heat stroke is one of the most gruesome ways to die truly horrible. It's absolutely preventable. These deaths are a product of bullying, a win-at-all-costs culture that is far too common in athletic departments. That culture creates the condition that costs the lives of talented young men and women like Mizell. And it fosters the abuse of hazing and sexual assault that we've seen at Baylor, Northwestern, San Jose State, and elsewhere. 
the NCAA in past years has failed to address this abuse as quickly and effectively as it should have. I agree uh, that we should set a strong national standard and we ought to enshrine it in federal law enforceable, not just put it in the statutes, but make sure that it is enforceable, either through the uh, separate corporation that Senator Booker and I have proposed to enforce an athlete's bill of rights or through some other means. As importantly as NIL, though, uh, we need to address enforceable health and safety standards much more broadly and comprehensively. We need to ensure that college athletes are able to get an education in return for their blood, sweat, and tears. In July, I was proud to announce a draft bipartisan bill with Senator Booker and Senator Moran, the College Athletes Protection and Compensation Act. Our draft legislation would establish a strong national NIL standard, but it would also protect the well-being and educational success of student athletes. Our student athletes' rights package would set health and safety standards to protect college athletes from serious injury, mistreatment, abuse, and even death. It would guarantee tuition and aid to student athletes that suffer a career-ending injury or are cut from a team. It would establish a medical trust fund to cover health care for long-term injuries resulting from college athletes' participation in sports, and it would bring transparency to the NIL market and to college athletes' programs. We've talked about these kinds of reforms for more than a decade. The time for action is now. There are lives ongoing, careers at stake, individuals who really need and deserve this kind of protection. And I'm very grateful to Senator Durbin and the committee for addressing this topic. And I'd like to turn now to the ranking member. <clears throat> Thanks, Senator Blumenthal. Uh, yeah, we're hoping that uh, Senator Durbin gets back soon. I don't know what his 40 time will be after the knee injury, but in my case, I just want to run 40. I don't care how long it takes. Um, I'm going to try to get uh, Senator Booker's number and put it online, see if we make a little, little money. What number were you? 81. Um, so we meet today with the world on fire. To my Democratic colleagues, you have been very good to work with in trying to find a response to this horrific attack by Hamas against Israel that will make the world a better and safer place. So as we talk about one of the more fun things in American life, college sports, um, I just want to let everyone out there know that uh, this committee is working hard to try to find a way to be helpful. Uh, in terms of being helpful, where I come from, South Carolina and many people on this side, college football is not a sport, it's a religion. <laughs> and we're very concerned about where this thing is going. I think there's a lot of bipartisan support. There needs to be a national standard. All of your schools need to have some guidance that applies to everybody all the time. Um, I think if you make college athletes employees, you're going to knock out sports programs for Division II. A lot of uh, non-revenue generating sports, particularly in women's athletics, will go, go away. As you try to elevate some of the star players to make sure they get a piece of the pie, we don't want to create an environment where Division II or smaller Division I schools will be knocked out of the game because they can't afford it. I want it still to be an amateur sport to the best that we can. So to me, I want to associate myself with what Senator Blumenthal said. There needs to be a federal standard. Utah uh, is offering everybody on the team a new truck. <laughs> There's no end to this. You know, donors are out there competing ferociously. And Pro sports, you sign a contract, that means nobody's going to take that player away from you for a certain period of time. you got a chance to get your money back. Between the portal and NIL, college football is in absolute chaos. And we need to fix it. And so national legislation is the only way to fix it. 
and in our, in our desire to protect the athlete, which is a worthy goal, we can't destroy by making it so expensive non-revenue generating sports. And we want to make sure that athletes at every level in college, smaller colleges, can play too. That's the goal. I look forward to trying to find a solution. Thank you. Thanks, Senator Graham. Uh, I'll introduce the witnesses, and then we'll swear them in and turn to their statements. We're pleased to have all of you here today. Uh, Charlie Baker, our first witness, is president of the National Collegiate Athletic Association, or the NCAA. Mr. Baker is a former basketball player at Harvard who also happened to serve as governor of Massachusetts from 2015 to 2023. We're joined by uh, Tony Petiti, commissioner of the Big Ten Conference. The Big Ten, one of the so-called Power Five conferences, is home to several powerhouse college athletic programs, which I know Chair Durbin would like to note includes the University of Illinois and Northwestern University. Our next witness is Trinity Thomas, an all-American gymnast at the University of Florida. Among her many accomplishments, Ms. Thomas is a two-time Honda Award winner given to top female athletes in college gymnastics, and she holds the NCAA record for perfect tens with 28. She is currently pursuing her second master's degree and has built an impressive NIL portfolio. We are also joined by Ramogi Huma, executive director of the college players at National College Players Association organization he helped, helped to found for college athletes' rights. Mr. Huma earned a bachelor's degree and a master of public health degree from UCLA, where he was a member of the football team, and he's been very helpful in the past, not only in advocacy, but also in helping us shape legislation. Mr. Walker Jones, executive director of the Grove Collective, an entity designed to help athletes at the University of Mississippi monetize their NIL rights. Mr. Jones graduated with a bachelor degree from the University of Mississippi, where he was a member of the college football team. Ms. Jill Bodensteiner, Vice President and Director of Athletics at St. Joseph's University, member of the Board of Directors of Women's Leaders in Sports. She can speak to the perspective of how smaller universities are dealing with the advent of NIL. And finally, uh, Jack Swartbrick. Vice President and Director of Athletics at the University of Notre Dame. Mr. Swarbrick has helped to shape modern college athletics. Earlier this year, he co-authored an op-ed in the New York Times discussing the state of college sports. We welcome all of you, and would you please rise to take the oath, which is our custom. Do you swear that the testimony that you will give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God. Thank you. Mr. Baker, we'll begin with your testimony, please. I think your, your microphone may not be on. Better? Yep. OK. Thank you very much, Senator Blumenthal, to you and to Ranking Member Graham and the distinguished members of the committee. I want to start by thanking you all for the opportunity to be here today. Before I begin, I do want to say that on behalf of college sports generally, we condemn the recent violence perpetrated by Hamas. These acts were horrific, hard to comprehend, and our thoughts are with the people of Israel and the innocents that are involved in that conflict. In advance of my testimony today, we did speak with leaders from all three divisions and others to ensure that I'm speaking for as broad a collection of NCAA voices as possible. That this committee has made time to discuss college sports speaks to their importance, and we very much appreciate it. College sports are a ticket to an education for half a million young people, generating $4 billion in college aid. College sports are cornerstones to countless campuses and in turn, they are cornerstones for thriving communities. College sports are America's Olympic pipeline with 75% of the 2022 Team USA coming up through NCAA sports. College sports are also long overdue for a change. 
but I'm proud to say we have been doing something about that. Since I took over as NCA president seven months ago, we created a student athlete health insurance fund. It will provide all athletes across all three divisions access to health insurance for athletically related injuries for up to two years post eligibility or graduation. Every D1 school is now required to provide health care benefits, degree completion funds for at least 10 years after they stop competing, and mental health services to their student athletes. Scholarships are protected, and schools must offer academic counseling, financial literacy, and career preparation. We've prioritized equitable championship experiences, and I've directed national office leadership to put gender equity at the center of everything they do. The NCA also continues to advance common sense changes to sports betting policies and enforcement policies that penalize the adults, not the young people. And the NCA is moving NIL bylaws forward to improve outcomes for student athletes. We share your concern there because they deserve to profit from the NIL free from manipulation. These changes are long overdue and they're happening now thanks in part to call for, calls for action from members of this committee and from the student athletes themselves. But there are some issues college sports face that we the NCAA cannot address on our own. Our new NIL bylaw proposal requires student athletes to disclose certain information to their schools only and offers incentives to use fair contract terms and reputable agents. We want to partner with Congress to go further and curtail inducements and prevent collectives and other third parties from tampering with students and we would like to have a national standard where a patchwork of laws, as you pointed out, Senator Blumenthal, currently exists. Schools, conferences, and the NCAA are making changes to the benefits that we provide and to enable enhanced benefits while protecting programs from a one-size-fits-all approach. We support codifying current regulatory guidance into law by granting student-athletes special status that would affirm that they are not employees. And on this point, we're not alone. I visited August Augustana College in South Dakota a few months ago with Senator John Thune to hear student athletes talk about why they don't want to become employees. The elected student athlete representatives from all three divisions are on record saying the same thing. They fear the current legal landscape turning them into employees and they have called for action. The athletic conferences representing the vast majority of historically black colleges and universities have also supported this policy. They believe the progress they've made educating young people of color would be at risk if their athletic departments had to become employers. We also think there's opportunity for Congress to ensure in this new era of collectives that there's no discrimination on the basis of race, gender, or sport in the marketing or facilitation of NIL agreements. And lastly, we want to partner with Congress to grant limited liability protection so we can set reasonable competition standards and enforce student health and well-being requirements with direction from Congress. Let me just close with this. We're grateful for the time you're giving us today and appreciate the chance to exchange ideas with you. And I learned serving as governor that the legislative branch has immense power and rightfully yields it, yields it sparingly. But I believe we can find common ground on this and I look forward to helping student athletes succeed in this new era. Thank you. Thanks, Governor Baker. Mr. Petiti. Thank you, Senator Blumenthal, Ranking Member Graham, and distinguished members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss the pertinent issues impacting collegiate athletics, including name, image, and likeness, commonly known as NIL. And thank you for your strong commitment to finding legislative solutions. <laughs> we have been working closely with Senators Cruz, Blumenthal, and Booker on their legislative proposals, and I am encouraged to see their strong interest on addressing the issues facing college sports. My name is Tony Petiti, and since May, I've been proud to serve as the seventh commissioner of the Big Ten Conference, the country's oldest Division I collegiate conference. Although I've only been the Big Ten commissioner for six months, I have a long history of working in professional and college sports, particularly at Major League Baseball. I'm also a former student athlete, was the first in my family to attend college. Like millions of Americans, being a college athlete helped me pursue a higher education while continu continuing to follow my passion for sports, which for me was baseball. The Big Ten Conference is deeply committed to academics, research, and broad-based sports opportunities for all students. We take great pride in the success of our student-athletes, both inside and outside of the classroom, during their time at Big Ten institutions, as well as afterwards. Student-athlete health and welfare is a top priority for us at the Big Ten. 
We provide both on-campus and post-separation health care, which guarantees that our student athletes have access to medical care and mental health services, both during and after their time on campus. While the Big Ten and other Autonomy Five conferences currently provide these important benefits, the Big Ten is open to and supports efforts to discuss additional health and wellness benefits for our student athletes. As we've all discussed in recent years, the long-standing RAT student athlete model has undergone an incredible and rapid transformation. We see, the confl we see this confluence of events as an opportunity to fundamentally modify the dynamics that exist for student athletes. We are prepared to modernize our guidelines to create a new framework for collegiate athletics, one that more fairly provides benefits to student athletes directly from member institutions, maintains broad-based sports opp opportunities for men and women, and upholds Title IX. We see four main challenges that must be addressed by proper regulation to better protect and serve our student athletes and to support a new governing structure. First, there are now more than 30 different state laws related to name, image, and likeness. Many states are passing NIL and associated laws designed specifically to provide their in-state universities with a competitive advantage in recruiting through the promise of NIL. To provide certainty, equity, and competitive balance, a uniform federal statute is needed to preempt this network of state laws. Second, because of a combination of court decisions, current litigation, and state actions, the NCAA is unable to make or enforce common sense regulations governing athletics. Through legislation, Congress should grant limited and conditional liability protections so that we can set and enforce reasonable competitive standards and promote student athlete welfare. Third is the ability to effectively identify true NIL deals from pay for play or inducement schemes, particularly with the precipitous rise of collectives. Student athletes are frequently being induced by collectives to attend specific institutions and transfer from one school to another without a true NIL deal. This has resulted in a pay for play system primarily controlled by boosters and executed under the guise of NIL. We are concerned that management of college athletics is shifting away from the universities to collectives. The Big Ten will continue to support students making true business deals off of their name, image, and likeness and provide student athletes the freedom to choose the institutions from which they will obtain an education. We do not, however, support such activity when it is tied to a pay-for-play scheme disguised as an NIL. Simply put, as the collegiate sports environment has evolved, so too have the motivations and goals of many collectives, which are now trying to create competitive advantages and are not subject to Title IX. We are already seeing that payments from collectives will not be easy to sustain. Without action from Congress, we will continue to lack the ability to manage collegiate athletics. Finally, I want to touch on the question of whether student athletes should be classified as employees. Not only is employment status complex, but it is contrary to the educational model that has long flourished in American collegiate athletics. The Big Ten strongly supports congressional proposals that would codify benefits for student athletes that guarantee consistency across states and sports without the need to classify student athletes as employees. With many new challenges on the horizon, we look to Congress for your partnership in helping us embrace change and ensure that we tackle these new challenges effectively while celebrating and promoting college athletics. Thank you again for the opportunity to, to appear before you today, and I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Petiti. Uh, Ms. Thomas? Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak here today. I've spent the last five years competing on the University of Florida's gymnastics team. Over the course of my time at UF, I've completed my bachelor's degree in applied physiology and kinesiology and my master's degree in health education and behavior. I've had the privilege of competing before and after name, image, and likeness. Opportunities became available for student athletes. The experiences that I've had along the way have helped me develop into the young woman that I am today. I'm currently serving as student assistant coach for the gymnastics team at the University of Florida while pursuing a second master's degree in entrepreneurship and training for a chance to compete at the U.S. Olympic trials in 2024. As a student athlete at the University of Florida, I've had the opportunity to receive an education from a top five university while also competing against some of the best gymnasts in the nation. Competing against the best athletes on the biggest stages has provided me with more opportunities than I ever imagined possible when I started gymnastics as a little girl in Pennsylvania. One of the biggest opportunities that college gymnastics has given me is the ability to benefit from the changes in NIL policies that have recently come to, to college athletics. While student athletes weren't yet able to benefit from NIL when I first arrived at the University of Florida, 
I was immediately intrigued once the rules were changed. It took many of my, me and my fellow athletes time to learn to navigate the waters of NIL, and everyone is still learning as we go, given it is a new and uncharted territory. It's been interesting to navigate, but I was able to interview and sign with agencies, partner with various companies, learn to become an entrepreneur, focus on building my brand, and work on so many cool personal projects that mean a lot to me. The first year that student athletes had the ability to take advantage of NIL, I was able to get iPads for my younger siblings as Christmas gifts. Kids' gymnastics camps had the ability to promote the fact that I would be coming to work with them. I worked with companies to support women's sports and more. Unfortunately, one of the parts of NIL that makes it difficult for student athletes is the varying laws and regulations that are in place from state to state. There currently is no single standard that applies to all student athletes in all sports, which oftentimes leaves us confused. In some cases, the different laws also place certain student athletes at a disadvantage depending on where they go to school. Recently, I was invited to attend SEC Day on the Hill in Washington, D.C. to speak with representatives from Congress. Most of my discussions centered around the issue of NIL and allowed me to share some of my personal experiences as a student athlete, including how NIL policies have impacted me personally, both the positives and the areas where there could still be improvements. While the discussions were positive, it seems clear that the best path forward for everyone would be if we had a federal NIL policy that applied to all athletes from every sport, at every school, and at every level. This will create equal opportunity for all student athletes to benefit from NIL and will create a uniform standard to ensure we're all playing by the same rules and eliminate confusion and unfair advantages. A federal law will also have the benefit of ensuring the future of sports, like gymnastics, are protected. The SEC is one of the nation's hotbeds for showcasing and developing Olympic talent. And it would be a huge loss that would be felt well beyond just college athletics if these sports were put at risk due to any future legislation that might come from one state or another. Protecting the future of my sport and the dozens of other sports that have developed future Olympians should be a top priority. Not only do women's and Olympic sports at the collegiate level help young women like me receive a college education, but they also help athletes benefit from the very same NIL opportunities that I have experienced during my time as a student athlete at the University of Florida. While college sports took a step forward with NIL during my time as a student athlete, more can still be done to better the lives of all student athletes. I'm hopeful we will soon have a national standard and the, college, the future of college athletics will be improved for the next generation of great student athletes. Thank you for taking the time to focus on a topic that is important to me and hundreds of thousands of student athletes all over the nation. Thank you so much, Ms. Thomas. Uh, Mr. Huma. Good morning. Uh, first, I'd like to thank Chairman Durbin and Ranking Member Graham, Senator Blumenthal, for allowing me to testify today. Uh, the National Col College Players Association, the NCPA, served as a sponsor of the first state NIL law in the nation and successfully fought for the passage of NIL laws in a dozen other states. College athletes now have the ability to earn NIL compensation, just like other college students and American citizens. As hard as the NCPA has fought for college athletes' NIL freedoms, NIL should not be a priority for Congress because athletes already have these freedoms. While there are some NIL-related areas that should be fine-tuned, such as athlete agent certification, there are more important issues that athletes desperately need Congress to prioritize. Instead of adopting an NIL-only bill, Congress should include broad-based reform that is critical in protecting college athletes. Many are shocked to learn that the NCA refuses to enforce safety standards. It's not against NCA rules for college athletics personnel to force an athlete back into the same game with a concussion, sexually abuse an athlete, or kill an athlete in a hazardous workout. Instead of helping these athlete victims, the NCAA coldly responds that it has no duty to protect college athletes. Then whose duty is it? These, these colleges receive federal funds while creating hazardous conditions for their athletes. The NCPA's stance is that Congress has a responsibility to protect college athletes. The NCPA asked this committee and Congress not to follow the NCAA's league by skirting this important duty. The NCPA is grateful for so many of the members of this committee taking an active role and trying to address problems in NCAA sports through legislation. 
We believe there can be a bipartisan solution that can iron out some of the NIL issues as well as bringing forth critical broad-based reform, including the enforcement of safety standards, coverage for athlete sports-related medical expenses, and prohibiting the NCAA from discriminating against female college athletes like we saw during its March Madness tournament. The NCPA has been working closely with Senators Booker, Blumenthal, and Moran on a bipartisan draft that not only addresses NIL issues, it includes important broad-based reforms. And this draft continues to head in a promising direction. As a practical matter, any bipartisan legislation that can actually move through the Senate cannot have poison pills that would kill it. Such a bill shouldn't attempt to require or prohibit athlete revenue share, require or prohibit athlete employment status, or attempt to give NCAA sports an antitrust exemption. There are strong beliefs about these areas among stakeholders, but these issues should be set aside so that bipartisan progress can be made in other important areas. Both before and after state NIL laws became effective, the NCAA and its conferences lobbied Congress for an antitrust exemption, which the NCPA strongly opposes. Antitrust lawsuits, US DOJ antitrust investigations, and state legislation targeting NCAA antitrust violations have brought forth important economic freedoms and protections for college athletes. Because of antitrust laws, the NCAA can no longer price fix an athletic scholarship below the cost of attendance, limit scholarships to only one year, prohibit colleges from providing medical coverage to athletes, or ban athletes from earning NIL compensation. The NCAA is a chronic antitrust violator and a glaring example of why antitrust laws are needed in this country. Another important issue, and one that is worthy of its own separate bill, is the harmful conference realignment that will require college athletes to spend many additional hours traveling at the expense of their academics and their health. These developments are nothing but a greedy TV money grab that treats athletes like commodities and an education like a punchline. Using athletes in predominantly black sports to generate more TV dollars at the expense of their education while black football and basketball athletes suffer the lowest graduate graduation rates is unjustifiable. Another problem is that as mega conferences emerge, each team and fan base will have less of a chance to win their conference. Colleges in mega conferences are literally selling out their athletic future for TV dollars. Just to give a pay bump to coaches, athletic, administration, athletic administrators, and spend on more shiny facilities. This is short-sighted, this harms college athletes, and the NCPA is encouraging Congress to pass legislation that would base conference realignment on reasonable regional proximity and limit the number of colleges in a conference. It's no secret that there are part partisan divisions in many areas in American life, but sports is a special area. The NCPA has worked with lawmakers on both sides of the aisle to pass NIL laws in red states, blue states, and purple states, because when it comes to the well-being of college athletes, Lawmakers who care about athletes find themselves on the same team, regardless of the political party. Every future, current, and former college athlete in each of your states needs you to join this team and pass meaningful, broad-based legislation. Thank you. Thanks very much, Mr. Huma. Mr. Jones. Senator Blumenthal, Ranking Member Graham, and members of the committee, thank you so much for inviting me to, to be here today. My name is Walker Jones, and I'm the executive director of the Grove Collective, representing student athletes at the University of Mississippi. And I'm also a founding member of the TCA, or the Collective Association, which is comprised of 25 collegiate collectives from across the Power Five landscape, serving as advocates for over 50,000 student athletes in 25 sports. Our goal is to serve as a unified voice to shape the development of NIL, of the NIL market in college sports, while creating a sustainable, model that gives student athletes the ability to maximize their NIL platforms. Current data shows that collectives are responsible for approximately 80% of the money being paid to NCAA athletes through their NIL activities. Given this figure, the TCA is unique in that our members possess and are willing to share our firsthand knowledge of how NIL is working in your local communities, and we seek to partner with anyone who wants to produce well-informed and effective legislation benefiting collegiate student athletes first. Unlike all our stakeholders in college sports, we work with everyone in the ecosystem by sitting at the point of intersection within NIL commerce. Before we delve into the substance, let me be very clear about one thing. Our organization and I are extremely bullish on college athletics. Are there uh, aspects to the current model that need addressing and evolving? Of course. But the overwhelming majority 
of commerce with name, image, and likeness is positive. As a student athlete in the late 90s, I can tell you that today's student athletes have the resources and ability to deal with the realities that inevitably come to them in life. Whether they play professional sports or not, athletes now have the ability to solve for socioeconomic issues, stay in school longer to further their academic careers, locate the best possible competitive situations athletically, and be a more functional contributor to society when they leave their respective campuses. Finally, as TV viewership continues to break records each weekend in the college football season this year, and this past spring with March Madness and basketball, the marketplace for athletes to maximize their value has never been stronger. The NIL landscape continues to experience the inevitable growing pains of any free market model, but the overall health of college athletics is strong. The TCA members feel those in this panel today and other important stakeholders share the expertise and passion along with Connors to work together for long-term sustainability and growth of college athletics. If need is the mother of all innovation, collectives were born from the need for student athletes to have a stable, secure, and trusted entity representing their interests. Student, uh, student athletes trust our collectives, and this has caused some tension at times between our affiliated institutions collegiate conferences in the NCAA. But we are comfortable in the discomfort because at the end of the day, our singular focus is on the student athletes who would otherwise be forced to navigate this new and constantly evolving environment on their own. We root for and work with every student athlete uh, that chooses to work with us, not just the superstar athletes. While no one would be surprised that the majority of the student athletes and work originate around football and men's basketball, our efforts have particularly benefited women and non-revenue sports. In fact, there was a 20% increase in women's NIL deals from 2021 to 2022, and we expect an even larger increase at the end of 23. All this leads me to talk about what we as collectives stand for. We stand for creating opportunities for athletes to match with national and local sponsors, nonprofits, and charities, while creating avenues to interact with their fan bases. We are independent businesses separate from universities and the athletic departments, and feel our student athletes are served best by that independence. We provide resources and tools to help our student athletes not only monetize their value, but prepare for their future professions and careers. We provide best practices and standards to keep the bad actors out of the marketplace and create sustainability in the model. We provide transparency and disclosure to our university partners to remain compliant with state and NCA rules and regulations. And finally, most importantly, we are committed to diversity and inclusion in sourcing NIL opportunities for all athletes, regardless of the sport they play. Additionally, I thought it would be helpful to elaborate on what we as collectives are not. We are not owned, nor are we agents. We are not financial advisors to the athletes we serve. That being said, most of our collectives provide financial literacy uh, and tax planning uh, and, and uh, assistance with any financial uh, questions that come their way. We do not participate in the recruiting process and desire to not totally work with athletes once they have decided to attend our school. That is best left to coaches and athletic departments under the strict watch of the NCAA. We are not rogue organizations run by out-of-control boosters and donors. Most collectives operate as full-time businesses with infrastructure, staff, transparency with our universities and our constituents. I thank you for your time and look forward to answering any and all your questions. Thanks, Mr. Jones. Uh, Ms. Bodensteiner. Senator Blumenthal, Ranking Member Graham, and distinguished members of the committee, Thank you for the opportunity to testify here today. I am especially appreciative of the invitation because I fear that the voice of institutions like St. Joe's has been lost in the public narrative. As you know, college athletics is extraordinarily diverse. The reality is at a division one school like St. Joe's, college athletics is actually working quite well. Before we consider starting over and transitioning all student athletes across the country to employee status based largely on the issues facing one sport, I'd like to tell you a little bit more about life at St. Joe's. We have 478 student athletes, which equates to 10% of our student body. We offer 20 sports, football is not one of them. We have an incredible departmental culture that is consistent with our Jesuit mission, holistic development of our student athletes. Our student athletes go to class and they select majors which they're passionate about. More than half of our student athletes participate in sports that aren't bound to a regular season conference schedule, meaning that they rarely travel overnight and miss class. Our student athletes outperform our non-student athletes in GPA, 
retention rates, and graduation rates. We have many student athletes who are former Olympians, professional athletes, Hall of Fame coaches, but most of our athletes go on to very successful careers outside of sport. Last year, just 3.9% of our undergraduate student athletes transferred. Our annual expense budget is just over $20 million, which includes almost half of that, which goes towards student financial aid. As you know, many Power Five institutions have budgets 10 times as large as ours. Our revenue, while growing, does not equal our expenses. In fact, the university subsidizes our athletic department to the tune of 80% per year. So why does the university make this investment? Primarily because athletes benefit and are enriched from the experiences they gain from being a student athlete, and it prepares them to be the leaders of tomorrow. Division I athletics also benefits the entire university by creating a more vibrant campus experience and providing national exposure. At St. Joe's, we're not waiting for an NCA rule to tell us to protect the health and safety of our student athletes. We do so because it's the right thing to do and it's fundamental to who we are. We employ dozens of individuals whose sole job is to support the physical and mental well-being of our student athletes and their academic success. Finally, outside of team travel, our number one operating expense is student athlete insurance premiums and medical expenses. I hope that you will agree that athletics is working quite well for student athletes and in institutions like St. Joe's. In my opinion, the primary crisis facing college athletics is the threat of our student athletes becoming employees. I practiced labor and employment law for 15 years before getting into this line of work. I do not believe employment status is the answer and nor do our student athletes. They don't want to have to apply for posted positions when they're, what they're really going for is an education. They don't want to go through the state work comp system for their injuries. They don't want to punch a time clock worried about what might be compensable time under the FLSA. If our student athletes are deemed employees, we will transition their financial aid to wages in order to stay competitive. The taxation differences between wages and tuition are extreme and not in the favor of our student athletes. Our 51 international student athletes want to compete and they would not be able to do so as employees due to their F1 student status. For these reasons and many more, I am passionate about the granting of special status to student athletes that would confirm that they are not employees of their respective institutions. On the other hand, we desperately need reform when it comes to NIL. Like most athletic directors, I've always been supportive of student athlete NIL. The legitimate endorsement deals like those obtained by Ms. Thomas are awesome, especially for women who have limited opportunities in professional sports and whose value peaks during their college years. Unfortunately, the current NIL situation is untenable for three reasons. Number one, NIL collectives are engaged in bidding wars for the attendance and retention of student athletes. Number two, under current rules, Title IX does not apply to collectives, resulting in a disproportionate percentage of collective dollars going to male athletes. And number three, the patchwork of conflicting state laws governing NIL are confusing to everyone, especially the student athletes, and create a profoundly unequal playing field. In sum, thank you for your attention today, and thank you especially for hearing the voice of the non-Power Five uh, schools like St. Joe's and beyond. Thank you very, very much, Ms. Bodensteiner. And we'll now turn to Mr. Swarbrick of your alma mater, Notre Dame. Thank you very much, Chairman Blumenthal, Ranking Member Graham, and members of the committee, both for the invitation to be with you today, but also for your interest in this important topic. Chairman Blumenthal, the University of Notre Dame shares both your sense of urgency and your belief in need for reform. <clears throat> I'm on the final leg of a 40-year journey to support youth Olympic and collegiate athletes. It's been the privilege of a lifetime because it's allowed me to assist on a firsthand basis remarkable young people like Ms. Thomas, for whom sport is a route to education, to leadership development, and to brighter futures. College athletics represents the most compelling example of that for me. It's a uniquely American asset that has enabled education for first-generation Americans 
made our colleges and universities more diverse places, contributed to the very fabric of the university community, and sustained and supported our Olympic movement in this country. But that unique asset must evolve if it is, continue, if it is going to continue to deliver those sorts of benefits. That we at Notre Dame understood that was evident in 2015 when President Jenkins became the first university president in the country in an op-ed piece to call on the granting of rights for name, image, and likeness for all student athletes. More, com more recently, in an op-ed piece, Father Jenkins also demonstrated our support for medical trust fund and for graduation guarantees to student athletes. The common thread in that view at the University of Notre Dame is normalizing the experience of student athletes against that of students who are not athletes. That was the basis of our opinion on name, image, likeness, and ideas. If every other student at our campus had that right, why shouldn't student athletes? Similarly, where there is a difference based on athletic participation, in this case, the risk of injury in contact sports, or the potential to leave early to pursue a professional opportunity, then a distinction is appropriate. And that's why we supported both the medical trust fund and the graduation guarantee. We recognize that that reform must continue and there's a necessary role for Congress to play in it, but it can be limited in scope. We, the members of the NCA, must accept the responsibility to do more. We support fully President Baker's efforts to reform name, image, likeness, and ideas, to provide the medical and graduation protections he articulated, and we must do more to help ensure that the opportunity to transfer does not undermine the opportunity to gain an education at our colleges and universities. But there are three areas in which we do need your help. The first has been referred to by several people here, and that is to make sure to retain the student athlete status as students. That status is being attacked administratively in, let, in, in litigation that's ongoing and in state legislation. It is central to our model that our student athletes be students and not employees for many of the reasons Ms. Bodensteiner articulated. But most importantly, our student athletes don't want a change in status. They come to Notre Dame to be students, to have the experience of students living in dorms, going to the same classes and pursuing the same majors. The risk of changing that model has many faces but the one that concerns me the most is the risk to our Olympic sports and our female sports in colleges and universities. It will create a pressure to separate the sports and that with that separation comes a challenge to the funding of our Olympic sports. We also need help in preempting the myriad of state laws which set different standards for college athletics. College athletics is the quintessential example of interstate commerce. We have more of our contests outside the state of Indiana than in it. And finally, we need a way to satisfy the student athletes' interest in competitive equity. They want the opportunity to participate and win. They want to know there's an even playing field. We have to find a way to deliver that to them. That can come either by empowering the NCAA in limited areas to enable competitive equity or to develop a process by which we can agree with our student athletes on what those rules and regulations should be. Our student athletes deserve the competitive equity that we need to deliver to them. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, uh, Mr. Swarbrick. I uh, thank you all for this really excellent testimony. We're gonna have questions now from committee members. We'll have five minute rounds uh, I'll begin and then turn to the ranking member, and then we'll go in the order of uh, appearance. Uh, what I hear here is a really strong endorsement of college athletics as a unifying force for 
our communities. And Senator Graham mentioned that college athletics is a religion in South Carolina. I don't know whether it is in Connecticut, but we celebrate victory in Connecticut. As you know, uh, UConn Huskies men's team won their fifth championship. Uh, our Quinnipiac hockey team was victorious as well. And we have parades literally through the streets of Hartford when it happens. So I think uh, you've all highlighted the unique unifying force that college athletic play and the opportunities it affords to students uh, and the unique opportunity that we have and the need to do it now for reform. Uh, I hear also strong reservations need opposition to classifying athletes as employees. I hear a general feeling that the reform very likely should go beyond just strictly NIL. And uh, what I hear very encouragingly uh, is that some of your colleges, St. Joseph's and Notre Dame, most impressively, are already embarking on many of the form reforms that Senator Booker and Moran and I have proposed. Uh, but we need to avoid a race to the bottom in name, image, and likeness, a bidding war among colleges that often tempt college athletes with unscrupulous deals or agents and uh, put colleges at the mercy of an unequal playing field. What I'd like to do is now focus on the reforms that may avoid the need for even that employee status that seems so lure, lure, alluring to many who proposed reforms. I'd like to ask um, all of you, and I, in the interest of time, I'm going to put it to you collectively, uh, would any of you oppose the creation of a medical trust fund to cover health care for student athletes' long-term injuries? If you would oppose it, raise your hand and I'll call on you. Nobody opposes it, the record should show. Would you oppose guaranteeing the scholarships of student athletes that suffer career-ending injury or who are cut from a team? If you oppose it, please raise your hand. Again, the record should show no one here opposes it. Would you oppose setting enforceable health safety standards to protect college athletes from serious injury, mistreatment, abuse, and death? Again, uh, no one opposes it. And finally, would you oppose a requirement for at least high revenue schools to support the insurance costs and out-of-pocket medical expenses of student athletes? No opposition. I think your, your views on this issue are profoundly important and show that we need to think beyond just NIL standards. Um, I uh, am struck, and uh, this issue has been raised, by the difference often in treatment of uh, women athletes. Uh, female athletes uh, under the present system apparently earn approximately $900 per NIL deal as compared to the $3,000, which is the average for male athletes, as reported by the NIL platform Open Doors. Uh, it seems to me that this area is one where reform is necessary. And uh, I'd like to ask uh, Ms. Thomas and uh, Ms. Bodensteiner for your views on this topic. Um, can you repeat the question for me, please? The disparate treatment of men and women in college sports, do you see it as an issue and how pressing? Um, yes, I do see it as an issue. Um, me as a female athlete, I feel like I personally have to do a lot more, especially in the NIL space, to 
receive what I feel like I deserve. Ms. Bowden Sanger. Thank you for the question, Senator. And just to, to bring a little life to that, right now at St. Joe's, um, you know, male, male basketball student athletes are, I wouldn't say demanding, but asking what the collective will do for them. Uh, that is not happening in any of our women's sports. Uh, and I think it's absolutely essential that we find a way to ensure that uh, male and female athletes have equal opportunity uh, to earn NIL money. Thank you. Uh, my time has expired, so I'm going to turn to Senator Graham. I have a lot more questions, but we'll have a second round, I hope. Thanks, Senator Blumenthal. Uh, so if Congress does nothing, where does this thing go, Mr. Swarbrick? Well, I think we'll wind up with a series of rulings that declare students as employees subject to the FLSA rule or other rules and regulations, but it won't happen uniformly. It'll happen serially and create an unsustainable difference from state to state. We'll have a patchwork of state legislation that will also create differences which are unsustainable. Um, that for me is, are, are the things that are most important to avoid at the moment while we continue the reforms that Senator Blumenthal articulated. Uh, Governor Baker, do you agree with that? Where do you see this thing going if we do nothing? Um, I would say first of all that I think the, well I appreciate um, Walker Jones's optimism about men and women when it comes to NIL participation um, the numbers are so, well, first of all, there are no publicly available numbers, okay? So the first thing we really need there, more than anything, is some form of transparency around what people are actually getting. There are reporters who cover college sports who won't write about NIL because they don't believe anything anybody tells them. That's well, one just of the hold on a second. Mr. Jones, who's the highest paid NIL person in college football? Well, with, uh, again, a lot of that is uh, some urban legend. Um, well, I'm not asking about urban legend. Well, if you're in this business, you should know. Tell me. Uh, well, again, uh, probably the highest grossing is a gymnast, actually, Olivia Dunn okay. from LSU. How much does she make? Um, again, she's making into the seven figures. I don't know the exact figure, but she's well into the seven figures in her endorsements. Mr. Petit, is that Tony? Can I just call you Tony? <laughs> That's fine, Senator. Thank you. Okay, where does this thing go if we just sit on the sidelines? I, I agree with what's been said. I think where we're going to end up is we're going to be having a system that's been dictated by myriad state laws, by the results of litigation, and by the results of employment action. It's completely unmanaged change. I think the results are unpredictable. Um, and I think the. the well, let the, me give you my concern. Yes, Between sir. the portal and the poaching of players, I think you have chaos. I mean, you got the University of Utah offering everybody who will play a truck. So <laughs> we're headed down the road here of a bidding war. Do you agree with that, Tony? I do. I think our coaches would echo the same sentiment across multiple sports in terms of just the money entering the system. It's called NIL, but it's not really NIL. So when we say that collectives are responsible for the overwhelming amount of money in the system, that money is not really true NIL deals right now. So I, I feel you are correct, Senator. So here's my concern to the committee is that, you know, college athletics needs to be available to men and women at every level, non-generating. Uh, Ms. Thomas, does the gymnastic team make money for the University of Florida, or do you know? I'm not sure. Okay. Well, uh, you have done, you've got a lot to be proud of. But there are a lot of programs out there that don't make money. Is that true, Mr. Uh, Ms. Bodensteiner? That is correct. If it's all about money, they're going to be left behind. Division two schools. If you made Division two, if you if you made people employees, uh, Governor Baker, what would happen to Division two schools? I think it's pretty clear that Division two II and Division three schools would get out of the interscholastic collegiate sports business and Can probably just turn listen most of to their what stuff he said. club sports. I mean, the, the it's going to happen, right? If you make these people employees, they can't afford it. You tax everything and you completely change the model. And it's sort of a 4x increase in what the cost would be if, I mean, the typical D2 school has an athletic budget of five or six million dollars. 
I mean, that's the way you should start. And D3 is more or less the same. It's 95% of the schools lose money on sports. 95, right? 5% of them have serious budgets with serious revenue and a concern about employment, but a willingness to do a lot more around what they believe they should be doing for student athletes. But you're right, Senator, the, the impact on D2 and D3, and by the way, a lot of D1 schools would be, and their athletes, student athletes, would be profound. It seems to me we want to avoid that to make you know college sports available to a lot of people at different levels. That should be one of our goals. Do you all agree with that? Everybody nods. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, let's try to find a way, uh, Senator Blumenthal, to, to deal with the, the money problem in IL, make sure that people are taken care of as athletes and there, it's not just a wild, wild west out there. But final comment, if this committee and the Commerce Committee doesn't act in about a year, this thing is going to be an absolute mess, and you're going to destroy college athletics as we know it. Thanks. Thanks, Senator Graham. I think Wild West is exactly the right term to characterize where we're going. Senator Whitehouse. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Chairman, for holding this. Um, we got so many witnesses here that it's going to be hard to ask a question and get through all seven, let alone ask a bunch of questions and get through all seven. So what I think I'll do is mention uh, three concerns that I have that you all are welcome to respond to in writing. We take questions for the record here, and your answers become a part of the record of the proceedings. So um, the first concern is um, helping student athletes avoid unfair contracts where they get like locked in for too long or get uh, locked into contracts that have huge you know management and other fees so forth who's in charge of protecting student athletes when there's so much pressure and money uh, involved um, and they're not exactly experts in the art of uh, contract negotiations so that's one. Two is um, the NIL will naturally take pretty good care of the star high-value student athletes. And the question is, when this flood of money opens up, how much should we be looking at the non-star teammates of the star student athletes how much should we be looking at the non-remunerative teams in addition to the teams that make enormous amounts of money? And what do we do about schools that don't field either remunerative teams or star athletes? Do they just get left behind? Or should there be a fund that tries to reach into all of those areas? Um, so that's two. And the third is a pretty obvious piece, which is that there are lots of injuries that take place uh, during um, student ath athletics. And um, how we manage those injuries out into the future, it would seem to me that it, loads of money is flooding in. One good, way to, one good thing to have it flood into would be a fund that can make sure that athletes get their health care covered for injuries that are traced back to their collegiate sports careers, even if the manifestation comes later. We do this with veterans all the time. You have an exposure during your service in a foreign country. 20 years later, something manifests. You look back and the VA provides the coverage, something along those lines. Those are the thoughts that come uh, to mind for me, and if you have any helpful advice on that, I'd be grateful to have each of you take a moment to um, share your thoughts in writing on those three. And with that, Chairman, thank you very much. Thanks, Senator Whitehouse. Senator Grassley. Yeah. Well, thank you all for coming. You're right in the middle of a lot of things that go on in the fall of the year with this uh, university sports and everything. Uh, Anybody that wants to respond to this, because it's a concern of mine, if there is no federal preemption of state 
uh, NIL laws. Uh, do you believe that there will be any Title IX concerns? And if there is a federal NIL proposal, what do you propose Congress do to mitigate Title IX concerns, if you think that there should be concerns raised? I don't expect all of you to answer that, but if any of you uh, want to dig into that, I'd appreciate hearing your opinion. I'd like to uh, give a little perspective here, I think, on, you know, Title IX is federal law and it's enforceable. You know, there are some, you know, the, the collective, it's kind of difficult to see the degree to which they are collaborating with the schools or separate from schools or any, anywhere in between. And, you know, collectives acting as an arm of the school, sharing central services. I think this was addressed in the draft, uh, Senators Booker, Blumenthal, and Moran. Um, you know, there has to be kind of a, a clear line. Are, is this an extension of the school? And if it is, Title IX should apply. Uh, if not, then it's just like Nike or some other third party out there. Um, and as much as we all, you know, the, the beginning of NIL, uh, it was all about free market opportunities for college athletes. The same ones that the coaches get, the pros get, every American citizen gets. Um, with the free market, sometimes the free market isn't uh, very equitable in all walks of life. If you look at advertisers, you know, there's been complaints from different groups that advertisers aren't including diversity in various areas. Uh, but you don't have Congress trying to come in and, and define things. You know, the free market's one thing. We advocate on our, our organization when it comes to direct pay. You know, Title IX is, is applicable. Um, free market's free market. I think there was, there's issues being raised about whether or not male athletes get more than female athletes. And that is a reflection in part, again, aside from the idea that some of these collectives are actually acting as an extens extension of the school, which should apply, uh, Title IX would apply. Um, you know, really it's a reflection of society. There's an equitable, equitable treatment amongst various subsets of groups in the free market. I think that's what we're seeing here. Um, the other is to point out that this industry, no secret, $17 billion primarily generated football and basketball players, sports that are predominantly black. Um, the one area where they might have uh, freedom, equal freedoms is in NIL. Um, the degree to which any of this money is flowing more towards football and basketball players because of market interests, um, that's our economic system, free market, capitalism. Um, when it comes to third parties, that's the whole vein. That's what, when we advocated from California, the very first NIL state and every state in between, that's clearly understood. I think there's a bit of a blur here when we're talking about third party NIL uh, versus things that the school gives directly. Again, if a collective is an extension of the school, um, then it absolutely should be, uh, Title IX should apply. But Title IX is the law, it's enforceable now, and um, complaints should go to the Department of Education, Office for Civil Rights in the appropriate areas, lawsuits. But I don't know that it's uh, even appropriate for Congress to start dictating what the free market should look like only for college athletes, uh, which may so happen to take money out of black athletes' pockets in the first, after the first couple of years of them finally getting equal treatment. I think that would be uh, inappropriate and, and misguided. Still got a minute left, anybody else? Yes, sir, Senator Grassley, I'd like to respond to that as well. And just speaking to Title IX from a collective standpoint, you know, what we're seeing, remember, we're just now into year three of this marketplace. So it's still evolving, we're still adjusting. But I can tell you on the ground level from a trend standpoint, we are seeing a correction on those revenue sports, your football, men's basketball, and some self-governance that takes that's taking place with the way we're contracting with the student athletes. But the inverse is happening for our non-revenue and women's sports. We are seeing more and more deals that are asking for female involvement. I know speaking from the University of Mississippi standpoint, we've tripled our female roster of, of NIL uh, from last year to this year. Our first team-wide deal at Ole Miss was our women's basketball team. Some of the highest earners in NIL, as I told Senator Graham, are female athletes. Now, there's not as many of them, but what I would just encourage everybody that whether Title IX – um, applies to us from a collective standpoint or not, it would not change how we operate. 
we are operating to have a very diverse and inclusive athlete roster because at the end of the day, that's what brands want. And that creates more value when we have brand campaigns and we are getting requests from outside brands more for female student athletes. So that trend is developing. Is it acceptable to this point? Not acceptable, but it is moving in the right direction. So while your high revenue sports are kind of self-governing and correcting themselves, your non-revenue and female sports are seeing a boost as the figures are showing us and what we're seeing at the ground level. Mr. Chairman, I'll put the rest of my questions for answer in writing. Thank you, Senator Grassley. You're welcome to do so. Thank you. Senator Coons. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Swarbrick, um, I read with great interest your editorial uh, along with Father Jenkins and uh, just wanted to lift up your focus on college athletics as part of a route to education, to leadership, uh, and to opportunity. Um, your focus on uh, and your support for uh, medical trust fund and graduation guarantees I thought was admirable. Uh, I want to focus in on one area, which is whether or not student athletes should be considered employees. Um, this is currently being examined in the Third Circuit and the NLRB, and that um, sparked fierce opposition from uh, your institution as well as uh, Ms. Bodensteiner's institution, as well as the University of Delaware in my home state. Um, why does Notre Dame oppose classifying student athletes as employees, and what do you think the harmful impact would be on athletics across the University of Notre Dame and then across more broadly institutions of all sizes if that were to happen? Uh, wh what defines the unique American model of intercollegiate athletics, and to be clear, it doesn't exist anywhere else. It's a club system everywhere else in the world, is the integration into the educational institution. It is the opportunity to have all of the same rights and privileges as any other student. And if you put them in a separate category with all the consequences that have been articulated here, that goes away immediately. And, and it, we no longer have the model that we understand as intercollegiate athletics today and fundamentally separates us from the educational value. As President Baker's association points out regularly, the vast, vast majority of student athletes are not going on to continue their sport after they leave college. It is the education which is the primary value of their experience. We have to protect that. We have to protect their ability to be admitted under the same standards, to be educated under the same standards, and to learn under the same standards. If you take that away, you do enormous damage to those, those current students. Well, this is a period of huge change in college athletics, and as the chair and ranking member have said, we need uh, to act. And Mr. Swarbrick, thank you for your testimony, and go Irish. Ms. Bodensteiner, if I might, um, are there some factors that are um, applicable across institutions of all sizes? Your athletic director at a school with a different profile than maybe a Big Ten university or even the University of Notre Dame, are there some specific factors that are key to your institution um, and others like it in the greater Philadelphia area and across our country that Congress should keep in mind as we attempt to draft NIL legislation that would preempt state legislation and apply to all the universities in America? I appreciate your question very much, Senator. Thank you. Um, I tend to agree with colleagues at uh, Power Five and other institutions when it comes to NIL. I think our basketball coaches are as... Uh, are as disappointed in what has happened in the market than anybody in the country. Um, and so, you know, on the employment front, I do think we have some unique challenges if student athletes were to be deemed employees. And really, it's, it's the expense, whether through taxation. I mean, our, our you know, human resources department is overwhelmed as we are with two mergers uh, happening and to give them 487 additional employees to process, many of whom are, you know, leaving on an annual basis. Um, again, the taxation issues, I mean, for, for an institution like us, and again, I can't stress enough that we are spending 20 million and bringing in 4 million in revenue um, for athletics, that this would just be a, an untenable situation, which again, uh, I, I worry about the ability for us to continue fielding all 20 of our, of our sports. Understood. Mr. Baker, if I might, just a closing question. Across the different legislative proposals that are in front of us and across the wide array of state laws, um, what do you think are the most critical provisions for us to include in legislation moving forward? Well, I would certainly support the state preemption issue because there, I mean, 
if you think about this just at a conference level, most conferences have multiple states. And if you're trying to create anything that looks like a level playing field, and, and to get back to Trinity Thomas's comment about the fact that I thought she said it well, there should be one set of rules for all athletes across all sports and all schools. I think that's exactly right. Um, I think the, the employment question is obviously on everybody's mind, and I'm sure there are things schools, especially those that can do it, which would be the 5% I talked about before, who would do far more if they felt like they could do it in an environment where their student athletes were still students. Um, I think the issue around uh, safe harbor, limited liability, whatever it is you want to call it, I get the fact that's a really big issue. And what I would say to Congress is if you want to, if you want to create some sort of framework around that and, and guardrails, um, that's fine. But I do worry that we're going to head down a road where people are going to start challenging whether or not we should have, you know, minimum academic standards for people to be eligible to play. Uh, are people going to change the rules around, let's suppose we pursue, we pursue the rule that I was talking about earlier, where we want to create some transparency around NIL, because, you know, with all due respect to you, Walker, nobody knows what's going on. And everything is sort of a guess and a rumor. So when people say we're doing much better when it comes to women student athletes on NAL. I don't know if that's true or not, neither does anybody else. And I think we need to give the student athletes, frankly, a lot more visibility into what the price signals are so that they can make the best decision for them and their families. Under the current system, they're in a trust us game with practically everybody. And, and Trinity, I give you enormous credit for what you've managed to do um, in that kind of an environment. But there are a lot of student athletes for whom that's going to be very challenging. And, and I think the final one um, would be the, the whole conversation that we've already had about trying to figure out sort of the best way to deal with some of the issues around health and safety, because national standards on that, I think we can all support. Thank you for that input. I do think transparency, um, fairness, and preserving the educational mission that, that is at the core of higher education are key parts as we work together to move forward. Thank you to all the witnesses. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Senator Coons. Senator Kennedy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, it's clear to me from listening today that we still have a, a lot of work left to do. I, I want to start with trying to look at this issue from 30,000 feet. Um, for many years now, college, athlete, co college athletics has... Uh, uh, generated enormous revenues. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. That's a good thing. Um, the Supreme Court comes along in what, the Austin case, is that right? In 2021, and changes where that money's going. Before that money was going to... Uh, to uh, TV stations and universities and coaches and and uh, and others, I guess, construction companies that were building the new stadiums, and then after the Supreme Court decides the Austin case in 2021, the kids start getting paid, and all hell breaks loose. I mean, is that, is that what is going on here? The fact that the money is being redistributed and that's going to cause the world to spin off its axis because the kids are getting a share of the dough? Governor? What I would say, um, Senator, in response to the Alston decision is there is flexibility for schools that can afford to make Austin payments to do so, and they can make Austin payments in particular sports um, as long as they manage to satisfy the Title IX requirements. And, and they can choose what level they want to support, well, I, and they I can also that, choose to play Governor, or not. But, but you're, you're getting down into the weeds, and I'm not saying that's a bad thing. We're okay. going to have to get in the weeds. But that's what this con – before the Austin case, everything was just fine. And then the Austin case is handed down, and the kids start getting some of the money, not the adults. The adults have got a share. And all of a sudden, the world's on fire. What am I missing here? 
For the record, I support the Alston stuff. I also support NIL. I just would like to see a little more transparency and support for information to make it easier for student athletes to succeed in this space. Well, let me let me make this suggestion to you, and I want to hear from the rest of the panel. Um, I would strongly encourage you and your colleagues to try to get together and come up with a new system for us to consider that looks like somebody designed it on purpose. Uh, you may regret asking Congress to intervene here. Um, all of a sudden, you're going to be micromanaged. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't, and my colleagues have raised excellent points, and it sounds to me like we do have a, a, a bit of a, of a, I don't know, wild, wild west, as Chairman Blumenthal described it. Um, but I'd be real careful before you invite Congress in, start man micromanaging your business. Let me go back to the original question. Um, any of you, what am I missing about this? Isn't this fight over the fact that the kids are now getting some of the money that the adults were getting before? Yes, sir. It, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, the, the injustice that has been inflicted on college athletes um, seemed to be fine for the industry until uh, we won some co court rulings and state legislatures started passing laws. Essentially, the industry, the industry had a monopoly on college athletes' NIL value. They owned every penny. Nike wants to slap a logo on a kid, got to pay the school. Kid can't get a penny. That's what this is about. They even, many of the schools even said, hey, if, if that happens, we're going to lose money. Well, that means you've been stealing money from these kids if it's against, like, the Supreme Court, if it, if it violates antitrust law. That's the problem. You know, these, the opposition, even employment stats, all this is about we don't want to pay them fairly. You know, NIL, just so you know, this is not equitable economic situation here. That's like saying go get another job because we're not going to pay you for what you do here. You know, we're going to cap you. have a national price fix for a scholarship. No matter, and, and a lot of these schools... That's me or That's not. the NFL, man. Is it? <laughs> so, and we can't treat every division as if it's the same. FBS schools masquerading as D D3 schools, saying there are no employees here. You know, and Notre Dame, I know they, um, I would imagine they have students in the bookstore as employees. It doesn't seem to harm their educational opportunity. There's no congressional hearings about that. We're talking about equal rights. And this industry is operating in an illegal fashion. It's, it's breaking antitrust law, breaking labor laws, and now it's, the, it's coming home. And players are getting, you know, avenues and levers and pulling, kind of pulling leverage, and, and here we are saying the sky's going to fall. But well, I, it's I, not I the truth. I agree with you. I, I, I don't mean to go over so much, Mr. Chairman. We are talking about rights here, but we're also talking about money. And it just seems to me that this controversy, in part, has been caused by a, a, a model of redistribution for that money. And I've got a lot of sympathy for the kids, I have to tell you. The adults seem to, to, to be able to take care of themselves, but it's the kids that make all this possible. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Senator Kennedy. I, I just want to make clear before I introduce the next uh, senator uh, who happens to be the co-author with me of the College Athletics Protection and Compensation Act. There's no effort here to micromanage anything. And I think that uh, Mr. Huma makes an excellent point that even the limited benefits so far to college athletes that we've seen have come because of a fight, because of an effort on the part of advocates like Mr. Huma and others who are here to treat athletes more fairly. And nobody's been a stronger advocate than uh, Senator Booker. I'm pleased to call on him. He uh, genuinely would have benefited from NIL had it existed when he was playing football at uh, Stanford. We often joke, uh, I was a college swimmer, and there's no, one, no way anybody would have offered me a contract to do anything uh, in uh, NIL. But he was a genuine star, and he's been a star well, Mr. on Mr. Chairman, can I respond? Um, uh, and, and look, Richard, you make a very valid point, and I'm not denigrating anybody's efforts here. I, I'm just suggesting that we do need to be careful. Once Congress decides to get involved, 
um, it really gets involved. I don't want to have Congress in the business of trying to establish concussion protocols for each school because that's where it can lead to. That's all I'm saying. Thanks for that point. Senator Booker. Uh, Chairman, thank you very much. You've been an extraordinary partner and leader on, on, in this area, and I'm, I'm just grateful to have you involved. Senator Moran has been extraordinary, as has been a number of other Republican colleagues who I've worked with over the last, God, decade. Um, I want to thank Maria Cantwell as well, who's a chairwoman of the Commerce Committee, who's just done an extraordinary job on these issues as well. Uh, this is um, about to the day, the 10-year anniversary of when I was elected to the United States Senate, and I came here with to work on a lot of issues, but this was definitely one of them. Um, I have this strange uh, um, two thoughts about college sports. One is it's one of the best parts of American culture. I literally would not be sitting here today if it wasn't for the opportunities that were afforded me uh, as a football player in high school and college. It is one of the bright lights uh, at a time when America has so many forces dividing us that unifies us in a ways that I think is very special. The challenge I found 10 years ago is I, I and the first Commerce Committee hearing on this, I was very angry because I also knew the dark side of college sports uh, and knew too many of my friends whose bodies were beaten and battered, who were going in in their own pocket years later to try to pay for spinal cord injuries or uh, shoulders, knees, and God forbid I saw uh, the challenges with CTE. Guys who were coming out of ball who had... Uh, uh, head injuries, uh, depression, and so many other symptoms that we now know are symptoms of CTE, but nobody there to help them or support them. More than this, I, I just couldn't understand how we could have a system that guys who spent over 80 hours, 70 hours, 60 hours playing the sport who didn't graduate on time were going in their own pocket after their football career was over just to pay for the last few credits that they had. I couldn't understand how low-income kids who got a chance to play ball uh, didn't have the money to even, you know, uh, get their parents to come see them play while the jersey with their names on it were being sold in student bookstores for more money than one of their parents made in a full day's labor. And what frustrated me was at that time the NCAA was giving lip service to a lot of the changes but seemed to only move when they got embarrassed whether it's being embarrassed like Shabazz Napier saying I couldn't afford to eat when he won the NCAA championship or the embarrassment of showing the differential uh, treatment of women versus men in NCAA tournaments. I am, I am so glad that this group is here now because uh, the folks here before us have been extraordinary in their leadership. Uh, I cannot thank President Baker enough for being willing to work with me and my team for his what I think has been very progressive leadership in bringing about change. Commissioner Petiti, you have been a, a great uh, 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 partner in trying to develop something that could be bipartisan and actually can work to put some common sense guardrails. And uh, Brother Huma, we have been working on this since you and I both had hair. Um, and it is, uh, I cannot tell you how grateful I am for your leadership and advocacy in fighting for what most people who watch sports think should be the norm, that the men and women who are contributing most to this $15 billion industry should, at the very least, have some basic standards for health, safety, uh, and justice when it comes to these issues. And so I'm grateful to be here with folks who are really constructive in trying to find a way, number one, to preserve college sports, which is now being threatened, in my opinion, by a, a lot of the Wild Wild West, which has been mentioned. And I think, uh, Mr. Huma, you're correct. There is so much part, bipartisan place to land on this, while the controversial stuff we could leave aside if we could just find a pathway forward in keeping athletes centered and first. So I, I'm, I'm extraordinarily encouraged uh, by the work of Senator Blumenthal, Senator Moran, uh, the discussion document that we put out, the feedback has been so great. There is so much accord. We've got to move forward. And to Senator Kennedy's point, not to have any unintended consequences, to do it with a light touch but again, protect college athletes. Just very quickly, um, I'd really like to turn to the one college athlete that's actually here, uh, uh, Ms. Thomas. It's extraordinary uh, that, you are, that you are here, and I, I can't thank you enough for being here. Uh, you are playing and have played at a level that's just great. Um, I don't think folks understand uh, the physical demands and the mental demands 
Uh, you've seen very personally the challenges that mo a lot of folks don't understand what athletes go through while trying to balance uh, difficult academic schedules. And I guess I just would love to, in the last seconds I have, uh, why do you think it's so important that whatever we do, we prioritize the health, safety, mental health, well-being of, of, of college athletes, teammates, and others? Can you just express the urgency of the moment? Yes, being a student athlete is super difficult. Um, hours upon hours, obviously, you're a student too, and that's a lot already, and then you're putting on that. I mean, we, we practice um, every single day. We're doing something whether it's conditioning or practice or training or um, letting our trainers work on our bodies for us, it's, it's a lot. And the traveling on top of that is a lot and competing in our sport. Um, so everything outside of that that's extra um, needs to be so that it's taking care of us. I'm obviously not a student athlete anymore technically, but um, for all of my former teammates and all of the student athletes that are gonna come after me, I want the very best for them. I know how hard it is to be successful as a student athlete, and we just need to make sure that we're doing the best for them. Thank you. And again, uh, Tony Ramogi, uh, 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 Governor, I'm so grateful for the work we're doing. I really think we can get someplace for this. I just want to say for the record, uh, Notre Dame has been one of the best partners that we've had. It's extraordinary and honorable in the way you're doing it. And that's the only reason why in this hearing I am restraining from talking about uh, my best career football game when Notre Dame was ranked number one and we went into South Bend, Indiana uh, and upset, uh, I think Sports Illustrated called it the greatest upset in all of college sports that year, all sports except for when Buster Douglas beat Mike Tyson. But I'm not gonna talk about that at all out of respect for your institution and gratitude for your partnership. Thank you for your restraint. Thank you very much. <laughs> You should listen to Senator Booker when he's unrestrained. Uh, thanks, Senator Booker, and thanks for all your work on this measure. And I, I uh, second your thanks to Senator Moran as well as to Senator Cantwell and others on uh, the committee who have been very thoughtful on this issue. Uh, Senator Tillis. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for being here. Uh, Governor Baker, I think uh, probably a year or two from now, uh, you're going to consider being a Republican governor in a Democrat state, one of the simpler jobs you've had. You've got a lot of work to get done. Um, I Alre already do, Senator. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I had a question, and Mr. Hume, I, I want to make sure I heard this right. I think in your opening statement you said that the NCAA has no duty to protect college athletes. Could you, in about 30 seconds, explain to me why? The sure. basis for that in the uh, Derek Sheely versus NCAA lawsuit, where Derek Sheely was, he died uh, during a football practice, and the family sued. The NCAA's legal defense and public defense is that the NCAA has no le legal duty to protect college athletes, and it has kept that stance in every lawsuit in its defense. Is that a, I guess, uh, Governor Baker? I'm going to ask you about that, but I mean, a, a part of what we're talking about is that the universities themselves have the primary responsibility for the health and safety of the student. And, and it would seem to me that even if you want to set aside the, the humanitarian factors, that you want every athlete to be healthy every day of the week, doing the best that they can do to get the most people to watch that sport. It seems like there's an inherent, uh, uh, or not an obligation, there's, a, there's an economic driver behind trying to protect these people. So it's very difficult for me to have anybody you know, viewed as, as you're running through a mill. It just doesn't make sense to me. You want the best athletes on the field every Saturday. And in uh, in, in I'm a football uh, fan and basketball, I guess, every day of the week. It's harder to follow for me, too many of them. But, but I mean, there's a, I, I just want to dispense with the notion that you would actually have somebody recruit a kid to St. Joseph's and not care about their health and well-being. It would seem like it'd be in the forefront. Am I correct, Ms. Bodensteiner? Yeah, that was the comment intent of my opening statement to say we're not waiting around for an NCA rule, nor do we feel like it's lacking. We do it for, for several reasons already um, proactively, and if something does happen, our insurance and coverage is I just don't get it. Rich. You want the stars on the field because it's the stars that attract people to the games, and it's that attraction that generates revenue and, and creates uh, the, the economic cycle. Uh, 
Ms. Thomas, first off, congratulations on your academic and athletic prowess. How many tens did, did you say that you've, or did, uh, I think the chairman say you got over your career athletic? 28. 28. And I, I don't know if you're, uh, if you're not comfortable, just say you're not comfortable with this. Can you tell me a little bit about the income that you're receiving from your NIL contracts right now? Um, I'm not comfortable answering that. Okay. Well, I think it's interesting. I, I'd like to learn more, and maybe you know, uh, that I, I've read reports about, when we're thinking about NIL, we're thinking about Olivia Dunn, uh, Dunn I'm sorry, uh, gymnast who I think her career high in the une uh, uh, uneven bars was a 9.925. So she's never gotten a 10, and she's one of the most highly compensated people uh, in NIL right now. But I've also heard reports of people that are just making enough to where they can pay their college tuition, that, that, that they're finding ways through NIL. They're athletes, they're student athletes, but they're they're not the big names that are actually making revenue. Is that, did I, is that just anecdotal, or are we seeing some sense, Mr. Jones, that other people are finding this as a way to pay for their education and then move on to something other than the collegiate sport that, that, that attracted them? Uh, yes, sir, Congress, uh, Senator. I would tell you that, you know, one of the things that we're seeing at the ground level is athletes solving for socioeconomic uh, issues that are inevitable in their life. Uh, Family-related issues, uh, like it said, paying off a sibling's student debt, yeah. uh, flying their parents to come watch them play. So uh, the athletes, uh, which then also gives them the ability to stay in school longer and pursue their, their well, academic I, career. I think NIL, and I think everybody here has stipulated that they support NIL. I mean, that, that to me, uh, to, anybody leaving this meeting thinking anybody's detracting from that, I don't think has been paying attention. Uh, I do disagree with some of my colleagues who don't think, and I, and I think I disagree with you too, Mr. Jones, uh, that we don't need rules of the road. I think it was Mr. Swarbrick that said this is uh, the essence of uh, interstate commerce. Uh, it was one of you in your testimony. I thought it was you. But uh, I guess in, in my remaining time, uh, several states, we've implemented a patchwork. Uh, I think that we have to eliminate that. I think that we do have to create rules of the road. This is where it gets dangerous because it means Congress has to get involved to get it right. So I guess the question uh, I have, are there, is there a national model that we should be instructed by, or is there a given state or jurisdiction, and Mr. Schwalbrick, I'll let you answer this if you, if you have the information, that's done it particularly well or that we should be instructed by as we proceed down that path? Uh, unfortunately, Senator, I don't think there is an example to look to right now. So they're all just bad examples? Well, they're, they're, it's been motivated by a bit of a race to the bottom for recruiting purposes, right? And okay. so that, that's been the challenge. If there's one thing we could do that would address the Title IX issues and otherwise, would be try to get it where name, image, likeness, and ideas has to relate to name, image, likeness, and ideas. Mm -hmm. if, if, if we could do that, the, the most well-known basketball player in the country right now is from Iowa, and she's a woman. Um, yeah. When it's really about name, image, and likeness, you have an equity that, that's achieved, and it relates to the level of accomplishment and fame. In most pro teams, there's a handful of men or women that have marketing deals. But yet in college, everybody on the team has one. It's not a marketing deal. We need to get back to where they relate to name, image, likeness, and ideas. And Senator, just to respond to that, we are for regulation. We're not asking that there not be transparency. We are already very but transparent. But a national NIL? We're fine. If there's a national preemption on state statutes, we, we support that as and well. I'm, I'm glad to, uh, we are, I'm glad we are for that, that, and we are ready to work with any body that wants to regulate. The problem is nobody is, and we're having to re navigate it ourselves, but we support regulation and, and oversight. Well, thanks for clarifying. I think we have to do it. And, and folks, there are a lot of things. The employment status, Ms. Bodensteiner, I wasn't going to put you in that position. They become employment status. You're going to have a, a skeleton of an athletic program that you have today because the numbers don't work. They already don't work for you. You just reach a point to where there will be certain sports that will be forgotten in collegiate athletics, which really begins the, the beginning of the end of their sports being relevant at any level at the pro or, or semi-pro level. So thank you all for being here. We've got work to do, and I, for one, think that we should. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Klobuchar. Uh, thank you very much. I want to thank you, uh, Senator Blumenthal, and you, Senator Booker, for your work, and I'm looking forward to working with you on both my positions on judiciary and commerce to get this done. 
Um, I uh, will try to show the same restraint as you did, um, Senator Booker. It's not as good, but it's pretty good in asking my first question to uh, Governor Baker and noting that given that he's from Massachusetts where they play a lot of hockey, that the University of Minnesota Duluth and U of M women's hockey teams have collectively won 11 NCAA championships since 2001. I'm not sure you can have that record in Massachusetts. I, I got correct? nothing there. I got okay. nothing. All right. Harvard so, has won several women's NCAA championships, but those numbers in Minnesota are very special. Excellent, excellent answer. Okay, next. Um, I, can you elaborate on how the NCAA's new policies will help student athletes, uh, the ones that you note in your written testimony about improving financial outcomes, including uh, in areas of financial literacy, standard contract terms, agent registration? Sure. The, um, the policies that the D1 Council is working their way through should be uh, voted on before the end of the year, but they're basically designed to create what I would describe as some transparency and accountability. The, the financial literacy piece is something some schools already do. We would like to see everybody required to do that. The uniform standard contract is basically about doing exactly the same thing we do in almost every financial transaction industry in America, which is to have a contract that represents basic terms, and if an agent wants to move off of that, they need to explain to the student athlete and the family why they want to move off it. Um, the third part is to create what I would describe as um, a system where student athletes would make available to their schools what their, NC what their deal looks like, and then all that data would get de-identified and incorporated into kind of a public distribution so that if you were a gymnast, if you were a football player, if you were a basketball player, you would have some idea of what traditionally NIL looks like for you or for somebody like you so that you have some idea about what it is you should get. And then the final piece is to make sure that we have an agent's registry where agents have to, among other things, say they work for their customer, their client, mm -hmm. because there's way too many examples at this point of agents taking advantage of student I remember athletes. we talked about that when we met. Thank you. Um, Mr. Petiti, um, how do the lack of uniform rules, I think what we have 31 state laws now that have emerged, um, how do that lack of rules put schools and states without NIL laws like Minnesota at a disadvantage uh, because they cannot take advantage of state laws that preempt NCAA rules and are more permissive? It's, it's creating a recruiting and a transfer advantage in those states where money can flow to student athletes that, are, that is encouraging attendance, it's encouraging transfer. States that have not acted so far are in different positions. What we have, it's been mentioned earlier, is a situation where we compete in one conference across many states. We want that to be somewhat balanced. There's already enough. We have different size stadiums. There's a lot of things that impact competitiveness. But in this case, we're, we're, get, we're seeing states increasingly keep ratcheting up what they're doing to try to, to improve competitive. So it starts at one place, and the next state, the next state keeps going right. in one direction. And Ms. Thomas, does that lack of a single nationwide standard make things more difficult for student athletes? Yes, it makes things much more difficult and very confusing a lot of times. Okay. Um, another issue that's related, Ms. Bodensteiner, um, after 50 years, um, our Title IX, our athletes shouldn't have to fight uh, to get adequate pay. Um, as you know, Senator Cantwell and the Commerce Committee, we've worked to pass legislation, the Equal Pay for Team USA Act, which now requires equal pay and resources. Uh, how can we ensure that gender pay disparities don't persist under an NIL system? I think it's a combination of what Governor Baker and Mr. Swarbrick have ever already mentioned. Um, one is transparency. Uh, and two is getting back to legitimate NIL deals where the actual capitalist market is paying, in which case women will succeed at a greater level, I believe, than male athletes. But I think it all comes down to getting rid of this, you know, should be impermissible market of, of paying athletes to attend institutions. Okay. Uh, Mr. Petiti, back to you. Um, when we had a hearing, um, we all saw firsthand uh, Simone Biles, uh, Allie Raisman, Michaela Maroney, and Minnesotan Maggie Nicholas testify um, before the Senate Judiciary Committee in 2021. 
uh, by coming forward. We know they made a difference. What measures are the Big Ten and its member institutions implementing to ensure these types of abuse don't occur? We're very proud to have the final Olympic gymnastics trials destined for Minnesota in June of 2024, and I think there'll be a lot of discussion about that. So if you could just answer it from the Big Ten's perspective. Yes, thank you, Senator. First, we obviously we want to make sure we ensure the safest environment for student athletes, for coaches, and for the students that work in athletic departments. That's number one. Um, since then, we, we were the first to, to install a chief medical officer. The amount of attention and resources from the conference office, what we're trying to do is make sure that our members have you know, the best resources to make sure that we're, in, that we're guaranteeing a safe environment for everybody involved. Thank you. And I'll ask on the record, uh, Mr. Huma, questions I had about the um, announcement on the um, long-term health and disability benefits, which I'd like to, I'll, I'll do it later and defer to my colleagues. Thank you. Um, I think next is my fellow uh, Stanford man. I played tight end. I think he played uh, far right wing on the soccer team. Uh, Josh Holly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thanks to uh, all of the witnesses for being here. Uh, Mr. Baker, Governor Baker, if I could just start with you. I appreciated your comments in your opening statement about the attacks, the terrorist attacks on the state of Israel and the need to condemn those for what they are. Let me ask you about some of the statements that student groups on the campuses of your member schools have said recently. Students at Harvard wrote, they quote, hold the Israeli regime entirely responsible for all unfolding violence. Students at Ohio State University praised, quote, the heroic, heroic <laughs> resistance in Gaza. Students at the University of North Carolina claimed, quote, it is our moral obligation to be in solidarity with the dispossessed. This includes violence. Students at New York University wrote, peaceful discourse must be rejected and instead said there is no peace in a colonized people living under occupation, subjugation, and apartheid, referring to Israel. And finally, I'm sure you know Columbia University. Columbia is actually forced to close its campus when an Israeli student was assaulted and numerous Jewish American students were threatened. Would you condemn this rhetoric of violence and anti-Semitism at these campuses? I think it's important, and I say this as much as a former governor, as I say it as the current head of the NCAA, for all of us, whether we agree with someone's general political philosophy or not, to condemn any support for violence. There is never an excuse for unprovoked attacks on innocent people. And I, you know, I've said many times, and I said it a lot when I was a governor, that um, we have gotten really casual about the way we think about violence in this country. Um, and I said it all the way through the summer of 2020 when we had some really horrible things that happened uh, to members of our black community. And I think, the, I, I, think, I think we have a cultural problem there as much as anything else, Senator. And I think it's important for everybody on all sides of the political spectrum to call that stuff out. Good. I agree with you. I'm glad you're willing to say it. I think it's important that the NCAA be willing to say it. You've got many Jewish American athletes, I'm sure, and Jewish American students. Indeed. And while, and I think you were gesturing to this, while the First Amendment certainly protects the right of anybody on our campuses and across the country to say what they want peacefully, peacefully, that doesn't mean that we have to condone it and act as if it's morally acceptable. And I think it's, it's vital that we take a stand. I'm going to ask the Senate to take a stand on the same rhetoric and condemn it as the violent anti-Semitic rhetoric that it is. Let me ask you about a student safety issue of a different kind. Earlier this year, this committee heard testimony from a 12-time All-American swimmer, Riley Gaines. She testified that in March of 2022 at the National Championships where she was swimming, she was forced to share a locker room with a biological male, Leah Thomas. Let me just read from her testimony. In addition to being forced to give up our awards, our titles, and our opportunities, the NCAA forced me and my fellow swimmers to share a locker room with Thomas. Let me be clear, we were not forewarned. We were not asked 
for our consent, and we, the women, did not give our consent. Is that still NCAA policy? Well, first of all, I'm not going to defend what happened in 2022. Um, I wasn't there. I was still governor of the Commonwealth. What I will say is we have very specific rules and standards around the safety and security of all our student athletes, and anyone who hosts one of our national championships has to, know, has to accept that they know what they are and then abide by them accordingly. But, and, and does that include female athletes having to share locker rooms with biological males not being warned or consent? Do they, are they asked for their consent? I don't believe that um, I don't believe that policy uh, would be the policy we would use today. C currently, not in correct. In, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, let me just ask you this: Would you support the right of student athletes to unionize athletes like Ms. Gaines, Ms. Thomas here today to unionize to have some bargaining power on some kind of an equal footing to deal with the NCAA, whether it's over safety issues like this one, whether it's over name, image, and likeness, whether it's over compensation? It seems like these institutions have all of the power. The NCAA has a lot of power, as we heard from Ms. Gaines. Should student athletes have the right to unionize, to, to be able to speak with a little bit of an equal voice? I think the most important thing for us to remember here is to union. If, if student athletes were to unionize, and we're going to have court cases on that, which is why there's currently two NLRB cases that involve this issue, I'm more likely than not to, to not want to speak specifically to those. I do have concerns, and I've raised these before, about creating a system where you put one brush across all 19,000 teams, all 1,100 schools, all 500,000 athletes, and say they should all be employees. Because I do believe in your state and in the state of every single person on this committee, literally thousands of your interscholastic athletic programs will go away because it completely changes everything about what it means to be a student athlete and what it means to be a college that supports student athletics. And I think that's a, that's a problem. Well, I appreciate uh, your responses and your candor. Um, I will just say in conclusion that uh, I think we've got to find some way to give these student athletes a voice. And whether it's the issues like the ones Ms. Gaines raised or NIL issues or others, currently I think there's a huge power disparity. Thank you, Mr. I, Chairman. I can I just make one final point, Senator, which is all three of our student athlete advisory councils, which are elected by their peers, have expressed deep concerns about being considered to be employees. And I've talked to probably a thousand student athletes since I got this job, and I haven't talked to one yet who wants to be an employee. I think that's important. Senator Blackburn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you for being here. As most of you know, whether it's the Commerce Committee or here at Judiciary Committee, we have been focused on what we're going to do with the NIL issue and how it's going to affect student athletes. Likewise, we have been very concerned about men in women's sports and what that does to the student experience. And Trinity, congratulations to you on your outstanding record. I am absolutely delighted that we have the opportunity to hear your perspective uh, today. Governor Baker, uh, it's no surprise to you. I want to come to you first. And one of the things, <clears throat> pardon me, that we're looking at is the patchwork of state laws and how that affects so many different processes with the recruiting process dealing with NIL, different approaches, different types of collectives. So as you look at this patchwork, knowing that it's going to impact schools differently, whether it is Ole Miss or St. Joe or whomever, talk for a moment about how you're going to clean this up and what is your timeline for delivering it. Your predecessor never could give us a date, time, and place that something was going to happen. So give me a timeline, give me a way forward. I think every university, there's a thousand schools in this country that you all cover, and they all want to know what is that process. So thank you very much for that question, Senator, and I do appreciate the time you've given me on these issues. Um, 
With respect to student athlete transparency and access to information and consumer protections, which is sort of how I think about it, um, those are in the process of being written up, and I expect they'll be ratified before the end of the calendar year. Okay, and those are going to. And the implementation would be at what point? It would be effective the beginning of the next scholastic year. So let's call it August of 2024. Okay. Um, with respect to institutional involvement, which is another issue we've talked about quite a bit here, I would expect those to be done by March, and I would expect that right around March we'd also be dealing with the issues around recruitment. Also effective August of 24. Okay, so there. Now will the be question then becomes, Senator, those will be the ratified and voted on bylaws by the organization, by the NCAA and its membership. But um, that doesn't necessarily mean that in the current legal and regulatory environment, everybody will comply with them. And I fully expect at some point and we'll And then have with women, with men in women's sports, when do you expect some specific guidance? Because you just responded to Senator Hawley that you didn't think the situation with Leah Thomas and Riley yeah. Gaines, who, by the way, is a Tennessean, uh, that the position would be the same. So when will there be specificity on that? Well, first of all, the, the rules around, as I said before, um, the rules around um, transgender athletes generally are more restrictive today than they were in 22. Um, and I, I can state pretty clearly that no one's going to get forced into uh, any sort of situation that's going to make them uncomfortable. We make that very clear in the guidance that we give to anybody who hosts one of our championships, period. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Jones, if I could come uh, to you, please. Um, the collectives uh, are something that we have looked at, and of course, as we know and has been discussed today, 98% of your college athletes do not play pro sports. And then looking at the NIL issue, the financial benefit to the student, the need for financial literacy in this, the need to prepare that 2% that do go on to the pros because we hear 78% of those athletes end up in bankruptcy. Talk a little bit about what the collective is doing. You said in your testimony that you all don't help with recruitment. You jump in after the students are there. So how do you help prepare them for this? Well, I think a lot of what we've heard today about collectives are outdated perceptions that probably were formed over 12 months ago when collectives were first being formed. They weren't as well staffed, they didn't have as much guidance, and they were just trying to figure things out. I think collectives, like everything, has evolved over the last 12 months, Senator, uh, to a much more functional, well-staffed um, organization run by business professionals that provide resources and tools. Because at the end of the day, I think originally collectives were about just writing a check to the athlete. There's no doubt about that. But I think what's happened now, collectives, and at least for mine specifically at the University of Mississippi, it's as much about developmental as it is compensation. And I believe that's philosophically the way we should be going to uh, protect the well-being of our student athletes, to make them better prepared and more functional members of society when they leave their campus. So most collectives in the 25 and the TCA, we stand united for, we already are very transparent. We have our contracts on file with universities. We are um, all about, um, uh, getting the bad actors out with an agent registry um, and a standardized contract, we have no problem with those things. So we support a lot of that, what we've heard today. I just think the perception of collectives is outdated. We have evolved just like the market has evolved and we are giving our athletes resources and tools so they're better prepared in financial literacy, being a tax paying citizen, networking in business, protecting the value of their name on social media, and all those tools, and how to deliver an obligation we are compensated, which is the tools they're gonna need, Senator, whether they play, to your point, professional sports or not, and the majority will not, and the tools that we are providing on the collectives of today are helping them prepare for that. Mr. Chairman, my time has expired. I think it might be helpful to us, knowing there are other collectives in the room, if we could get a written statement from them of what their process of participation is with their students as we look at having some uh, certainty and consistency in this process across the country. Thank you. I'm turning it back over to the real chairman, but I just want to say next up is the Dion Sanders of the Republican caucus, Ted Cruz. 
That may be the kindest introduction I have ever gotten in my life. Uh, and and uh, I, I will say to the senator from New Jersey, he may find that introduction played in attack ads against him in his home state. So I apologize for that ahead of time. Um, welcome to all the members of this panel. Um, thank you for being here. Thank you for your testimony on this topic, which I think is an exceptionally important topic. College sports are amazing. They are something that, that pulls us together. We're in a time where it seems we can't agree on what time of day it is. We're yelling and fighting over everything. And yet every week, millions of Americans come together and they cheer for their schools and they stand unified and no one cares what race, what ethnicity, no one cares what political party they are, no one cares what religion they are. They stand together and they cheer. And, and, and that's, that's important. I get enormous joy uh, cheering for Texas schools every week. We, uh, uh, and, and, and that's true all across, all across the country. Um, college athletics has also been an incredible avenue for millions of young men and millions of young women to get a great education. Uh, young men and women who might not otherwise have an opportunity to go to college, to have their college paid for, and to get all of the benefits of participating in organized sports. Most college athletes will never play pro ball. They're not going to be on the cover of Wheaties box. Uh, they're not going to get a Nike contract. But, but they are learning discipline and teamwork and sportsmanship. And they're learning to be gracious winners. And they're learning to be gracious losers. And they're learning all sorts of skills that will help them every day of their life. And I'm very worried about the state of college athletics right now. Uh, in addition to serving on the Judiciary Committee, I'm also the ranking member of the Senate Commerce Committee, which has jurisdiction over athletics. And, and as each of the witnesses know, I've spent much of the past year visiting and listening to stakeholders, listening to the NCAA, listening to conferences, listening to universities and institutions, listening to athletes, uh, and, and across the board, I'm hearing real concern about the state of college athletics right now, that it is the Wild West, and that there is a real risk that if Congress doesn't ask, act and act quickly, uh, that we risk doing enormous damage to a system that is providing enormous benefit to millions of Americans. I've introduced draft legislation to address this issue. And the legislation I've introduced takes a different approach than, than some of the other pieces of legislation that have been introduced, and lots of members of this body have introduced legislation. There's a lot of interest in it. Uh, my legislation protects NIL rights front and center. I think it's important. I think it's right that athletes deserve to enjoy the fruit of their hard labors. And if, if, if their skills are generating millions of dollars and are a massive economic powerhouse, it's only right that these young men and young women should, should enjoy significant fruits from their hard work and, and their performance. But at the same time, I don't think anyone wants to see a world where you have a few giant schools with all the money that buy all the top athletes and we destroy competitiveness across college athletics. One of the great things about March Madness is 64 teams, and any one of them can win in any, give, any given year. That makes it incredible fun to watch. Um, I think it is also important that we protect college athletes across the board. So it's not just, you know, football and basketball at big marquee programs, but it's Division II, Division III schools. It's all sorts of non-revenue sports that are really important, but are not going to produce millions of dollars and, and, and you know, be on, on TV nationally. So I'd like to ask a couple of questions to each of the witnesses quickly. Number one, do each of you believe it is important that Congress act and provide a uniform national standard rather than 50 states having 50 dis different standards. Do you think it's important that Congress ask? And I'm just going to ask for a yes or no. Yes. Yes. No. Yes. 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 Okay. 
Uh, a second question and a difference between the way my bill approaches it and other bills is that my bill empowers the NCAA to work with conferences, to work with universities, to set the rules of the road. I think that's a better solution than the federal government stepping in, either an existing government agency or a brand new government agency. I think nobody wants to see Congress and politicians deciding what roughing the passer is. And bad things will happen, I believe, if government takes over college sports. So I'd like to ask everyone on the, on the panel again to answer yes or no, or actually not yes or no, but do you believe the NCAA should be setting the rules or do you believe the federal government should be, should be setting the rules? Governor? Well, that's kind of an easy one for me, Senator. I'll go with the NCAA on that one. I figured that. NCAA? I don't have an opinion on that. Okay. Uh, the federal government, by extension of establishing a third party. Okay. Uh, the devil's in the details, but the, we would be open to the NCAA. The NCAA in compliance with existing federal laws. Okay. The NCAA, especially if they can figure out targeting. <laughs> I, I, I'm confident Congress cannot. I don't understand who gets called for targeting, but I know it pisses me off when it's against my schools. Um, all right, last question. There's a big debate over whether student athletes should be classified as employees or not. I believe that would be a very serious mistake. It would subject scholarships to taxation. It would subject student athletes to all sorts of wage and hour regulations. It would mean if suddenly you have a receiver who drops a bunch of passes, you can be fired and lose your scholarship. All of that seems really bad for college athletics, not to mention the cost that it would impose on smaller programs that I think would lead to eliminating smaller programs. Going down the panel, do you believe student athletes should be treated as employees, yes or no? No. 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 Yes, for FBS football, Division I men and women's basketball. No. 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 Mr. Chairman, I would ask unanimous consent to enter into the record uh, two different letters that I have here. One is, is a letter dated October 13th, 2023, from four historically black athletic conferences saying any legislative framework classifying student athletes as employees would have a staggering impact on our athletic program in schools. An employment model for college sports is simply not the answer. And then secondly is a letter from the chair of the Division I Student Athletes Advisory Committee, uh, which represents nearly 190,000 student athletes, noting that student athletes should not be employees of their institution. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you. Senator Padilla. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I uh, had to step out for a presiding officer shift, but have been tracking this important conversation, which I'm not unfamiliar with. Right, Mr. Uh, Huma? I uh, appreciate you all uh, participating here today, and I have heard that uh, this uh, question of whether there should be a national standard versus state-by-state -state standard keeps uh, getting revisited, and I just want to register my position on that. I agree that ideally there would be a national standard, uh, but only if it's done right and not if it undermines or compromises any of the protections or gains that have been made uh, at different, uh, in different states. And, and I speak from experience. You know, when I served in the California State Legislature, uh, we worked uh, hard to pass the nation's first ever Student Athlete Bill of Rights. We even got through all the debates about student athletes versus athlete students, but that maybe is a discussion for another day. A student athlete's bill of rights to require universities to increase protections, health care, and resources to support student athletes, not just their health, but with a specific eye towards academic support and graduation rates. And so I want to make a point here. For the record, while the NCAA has reported that 90% of Division I athletes have graduated within six years in 2022, this statistic fails to include athlete transfers who do not re-enroll. Uh, there's other concerns about the methodology. Uh, bottom line here is statistics from NCAA are inaccurate and misleading. Using the standard federal graduation rate, just 69% of Division I athletes graduated within six years. So as we have this important conversation today, I want to make sure that uh, the billions of dollars in profit that is made off of the performance 
the work and the sacrifice of student athletes and collegiate sports is also used to support the pursuit of a college degree. Again, we intentionally call them student athletes, not athlete students. The student part comes first, not just the name, it also needs to come first in practice. Question for Mr. Huma. What protections exist today and what protections are still needed to further support student athlete graduation rates? Uh, thank you, and thank you for all the work you've done in the past uh, on college athletes' rights in California, setting a, a great example of what states can do. But, um, you know, first and foremost, the, if you look at the Pac-12 surveys, they, they did a survey a few years ago, and across all sports, athletes reported spending 50 hours a week in their sport alone. 50 hours on top of full-time school. Um, so, you know, that survey is not going to change the TV schedules and the game schedules, but it's important that athletes on the back end have enough time to graduate. So uh, one important issue is to make sure athletes have enough time to graduate. I know the NCAA is uh, saying that it's, it's going to pass legislation for years and years afterwards, but the thing is without enforcement, any rules that the NCAA adopts, if there's no enforcement, it's not going to happen. You know, so don't have to worry And, and so I'd offer to my colleagues for consideration a threshold, as we did at the state level, certain programs, certain schools whose graduation rates by program falls below a certain threshold would then trigger requirements for additional investment, additional support, whether it's tutoring or anything else. If we're genuine and sincere when we call them student athletes, right, not just athletes or athlete students. Um, I know my time is brief, but I also want to just ask a follow-up question to you on, in addition to academic support, uh, I mean, the mental health needs Stress is real, uh, and that's been under, you know, programs to date, conference structures to date. I can imagine, only imagine under new conference structures, more travel time, more money at stake, time away from home and family, et cetera. Uh, what recommendations do you have for better uh, supporting students uh, in that capacity? Well, I think first, um, if you address some of the root problems, uh, you know, it's making sure injuries are taken care of. Coaches can't push players back with injuries. There's a lot of um, athletes who are broken because they've been betrayed by the universities. Um, and there has to be a third party. You know, that's not the honor system. Uh, many schools do it right. Many don't. The surveys show it. The trainers are saying that co coaches are forcing players back in competition before they're ready. 59% of trainers say that. 20% uh, report returning players to play without even medical clearance. That's what's happening really at the schools. They're breaking kids. And now you realign conferences on opposite coasts. That's more pressures on academics, uh, travel, uh, their health, their rest. Um, so some of the structural issues um, need to be addressed. That will go a long way. And for the schools, many schools should be prioritizing having proper mental health services on campus. Yeah. And there's no such thing as a full four-year ride. Um, and I know uh, uh, my time is up, but I do want to ask just one more question because I think it's timely, particularly for uh, the state of California, and it's going to be for Governor Baker. Uh, it's my understanding that following the 2021 Supreme Court decision, student athletes are no longer forced to choose between their collegiate eligibility and NIL contracts. Uh, as all of you know, Los Angeles will be hosting the 2028 Olympic and Paralympic Games and preparations are well underway. To ensure the success of Team USA in these games, we must address any remaining barriers to participation by our student athletes. Governor Baker, you mentioned in your testimony that collegiate sports programs have been a significant pipeline for Team USA. Are there any remaining barriers for student athletes who are also Olympic athletes? And whether it's ac accessing stipends from Olympic training programs or endorsing products uh, during the games, uh, how would uh, some of the rules that are entertained at state by state or here federally uh, going to impact that conversation? Um, what I think I would like to do, Senator, is get back to you in writing on that because that's a really important question with a lot of detail in it, and I don't want to get it wrong. Okay, so I will get you an answer in writing. I look forward to that. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Senator Padilla. Senator Lee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. President Baker, I'd like to uh, turn to you first. A few minutes ago, my colleague, Senator Hawley, asked you a couple of questions uh, related to Riley Gaines. Now, Riley Gaines was here just a few months ago. She testified in front of this committee at another hearing. 
about how the NCAA discriminated against her when she was required to compete uh, against uh, uh, a biologically male athlete, Leah Thomas, and also required to share changing facilities uh, w with that same biologically male athlete. Um, a another female swimmer, Kylie Alons, uh, was so uncomfortable uh, being required without advance notice <clears throat> to share changing facilities with a biologically male competitor that um, uh, she, she went and found a supply closet instead. Um, now, when Senator Hawley asked you those questions, you uh, demurred, uh, noting that those occurred before you came on as president. I understand that, and I, I, I look forward to uh, those sorts of things not happening. But I, I think it's still relevant for us to ask what's been done about those. So I, I'd like to know first, have you apologized uh, to those female athletes and any others similarly situated for the trauma that was inflicted on them as a result of those decisions by NCAA? Again, Senator, um, I'm not going to speak to or defend what happened in 22. That's not my question. I'm asking whether you've apologized. I understand that. I don't know. I'm assuming you're asking when you say you, you mean the NCAA. Yes. Yes. I don't know the answer to that question. I'll have to get back okay. to you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, tell me what rules, regulations, restrictions, policies you may have put in place to allow these sorts of things from, uh, to prevent these sorts of things from happening in the future. Well, I can tell you that the, the standards with respect to participation for trans athletes in women's sports have been adjusted since then and continue to be adjusted based on conversations with other governing bodies. And again, I'm happy to put that to you in writing, which I think would be helpful. Yeah, oh, that'd be great. Uh, Separate from the issue of, of competing, what about the question of sharing changing facilities? Do you have policies that you've uh, adopted since then that address that particular issue? Is there a means by which uh, female student athletes are allowed, number one, to know in advance of when they might be required to share changing facilities with a biologically male student athlete? And number two, after notifying them uh, of do you have policies and procedures in place to allow them to make alternative uh, 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 arrangements uh, for changing facilities? Our policies with respect to um, the safety and security of student athletes participating in our championships is pretty explicit about making clear that student athletes should, should not be forced into uncomfortable situations. I will confirm that that would involve situations such as the one that you're raising here. And again, I'll get that to you in writing. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Jones, I'd like to turn to you next. As a former student athlete at Ole Miss when you played for, uh, for my colleague, uh, Coach Tuberville, you weren't allowed to receive any compensation. Uh, players now are allowed to profit uh, based on their name, image, and likeness, which can lead to great benefits for the student athlete and for collegiate athletics uh, more broadly. For example, because of NIL, some players may choose to stay in college longer, uh, allowing them to showcase their talents and at the same time pursue degrees instead of leaving early to go play in the pros. Uh, uh, the uh, University of Utah football team has re recently arranged uh, for their players to uh, uh, get leases on, on trucks, all of them driving the same truck, which uh, I know a lot of them enjoy. Can you speak to the role uh, that collectives play in NIL and their role going forward? Yeah, and uh, thank you, Senator, for your question. As I explained to Senator Blackburn, I think the role of collectives has evolved the last 12 years, and thankfully so for the student-athletes. Um, again, what may have been started just as a, uh, a organization to write a check or to compensate an athlete has now turned into a resource that provides tools, transparency, in an area that didn't have any. And so, um, you know, we got to remember, too, that these student athletes, this is a new uh, environment for them. This is something that they've never experienced, 18, 19, 20 year old kids and their parents. And they're trying to navigate their sometimes it's it's overwhelming to make sure that they don't do anything that would um, preclude their eligibility, would, would inhibit their eligibility. Um, and we have taken the approach at our collective at Ole Miss, but uh, the other collectives in our association about trying to make this just as much about development of the student athlete. Uh, financial literacy is really Really important being a taxpaying citizen understanding that when somebody pays you the, the service that you need to provide and the obligation that you are owed um, and all those things speak to making them more functional members of society when they leave our campus 
Uh, so again, I think collectives have evolved to, to create a structure where uh, we can provide guidance, we can provide resources, we can provide knowledge, um, and we stand ready, as I've said in my written testimony and today, uh, to have governance, to have oversight, uh, to have a federal standard. Uh, we share ready to work with all our colleagues up here on this panel and with the government where necessary, because uh, Senator, we're lucky enough that we deal with the athletes every day. We're in the trenches with them, we're in the realities, and we just don't buy into all the negativity that you hear. Are there some things that need addressing? Absolutely, but overall, the impact that NIL has had in the health and well-being of our student athletes has been overwhelmingly positive. We see that with our student athletes. We see them to develop their maturity level, and again, I think if we're doing our part we can provide really transparent and tangible detail to all the stakeholders so we can provide the necessary guidance and make the most informed decisions going forward. But I do think we have we are much more about development than we are just compensation uh, from the last 12 Thank you. months. Thank you. I appreciate all that you and uh, folks like my friend Russ Skousen do for student athletes. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Thanks, Senator Lee. Uh, we've been joined on, by Senator Manchin, who's done a lot of work in this area. I'm going to give him the opportunity to make a statement, and then I'll have a few Closing questions, uh, Senator Manchin. Well, first of all, thank you, uh, Senator Moventhal, for being so kind to allow me in. Uh, and uh, this is something very near and dear to my heart. It's good to see my friend, uh, Governor, uh, uh, Governor Commissioner Baker, I think is, would be the proper term, and to all of you. I know you're all here because you care as much as we all do about the student athlete. But, you know, we, I think we're losing sight of the word student because basically allowing them to switch around as they can right now with portals and everything else, there's, their chances of graduating is slim to none. And something has to be done. So here's what we've done. We have a, a piece of legislation, Senator Blumenthal, and I've shared it with him and all that. Myself and uh, Tommy Tuberville, who is a coach at Auburn, we've put a bill together which is called the PASS Act. And what we're trying to do is kind of put some guardrails, if you will, for boosters and collectives to make sure they're associated with the schools and they're in sync with the schools for the purpose of making coordination there. We're not trying to harm any student from able, able to sell their value. We just don't believe it should be auctioned off school against school. Pretty simple. If you got that value and that talent, you're on TikTok, whatever you are, get yourself a lawyer, get yourself an agent, and go to it. Just don't come to West Virginia University and then basically say, They'll give me this much, and now Maryland's going to give me this much, or so-and-so. So we're trying to take that out of it. The other thing is moderating the transfer portal. I was fortunate enough to get a scholarship at WVU and got hurt very early. Back then in the 60s, they still kept me. They didn't have to. But right now, when a, if I got a Division I scholarship, a Division I school scholarship, full scholarship, and one of the major sports, they're committed to keeping me for four years, giving me an education. They're that committed to education. The bottom line is I'm not committed to stay. I can leave the first month if I'm unhappy. They told me I'm going to play quarterback, and I go in, and all of a sudden you're going to put me defensive back. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I'm going somewhere else. That is not what developing young athletes is about. They're going to have to be structured and coached somewhere. So we're putting guardrails on that. Three years, freshman, sophomore, junior. Junior year, after that, go anywhere you want to. That coach has had a chance. Now, there's still going to be the waiver provision. I've spoken to... Commissioner Baker about all these things and if you've seen our bill if not we'll make sure you you receive it providing transparency of how these are operating clarifying the NIL activities which I just talked about providing additional protection for student athletes the bottom line is they should our main goal is to get them a, a, an education get them a skill set there's less than two percent to go into NL uh, NFL or an NBA or whatever they may think they would love to do. We all have those grander dreams. doesn't work out always. So that's the most important thing. The other thing, I don't know if you all have considered that most of these student athletes are receiving Pell Grants. So that means that the federal government is paying through Pell Grants for the most highest valued part of Scholastic is basically the money that comes in through the, the large sports programs. And that doesn't seem fair to me. All these schools have other students that really need the Pell Grants very badly, but there's enough value within the system that would pay for those students. I don't think anyone intended that to happen that way. It just has evolved. I don't know if you all are aware of that or not, 
It's been brought to my attention. I think that something has to be corrected too. Uh, enforcing oversight, also health and safety. And our bill basically says you will take care of a student athlete eight years after they finish their playing days or curriculum or graduate. And that means it has to be a sport related injury to the sport they played. So it would probably be in orthopedics, things of that sort. We're trying to make sure they have the full value of having a quality of a healthy education and have a healthy life to provide for themselves and their family, but also the experience of being a student athlete. They're coming in as professionals now. The NIL has basically just about destroyed what I know the system was and how it was supposed to be. Heck, I would have paid WV to let me go play. And I'm telling you, the love of the sport, it still has to be there. If it's all about chasing the dollar from when you're on Pop Warner teams and your parents are pushing you and all these, that's not what it was designed to be. So if they're that good, go right in from high school to the pros. Don't come through this college system and basically have an auction bid. It doesn't, that's not what it was intended to be. So I know everyone has different opinions about this. I've heard everything from players union. You want to really screw a school and screw Title IX and everything else, try that one on. And Title IX is going to get hurt the worst. And no one's even looking at that to the point to where we're just worried about the two major sports that have all the money. Uh, so, I, I, you know, I've got a lot of problems. I really do with this, seeing it up close and personal, seeing a lot of young men and women who've really made tremendous contributions to society, not through athletics after they finished the athletic scholarship they had. They did it because they were developed young people who were matured enough to go out and share their, their value. And that's been tremendous. I think, I've always said this, I never could figure out. When we were in school, we used to get tickets, and we would sell the tickets, and that gives us a little bit of spending money. We got $30 a month for, for laundry. That was it. I, I said, that's pretty good. We could almost live on $30 a month back in the 60s. So we felt good about all these things. But then we thought, man, I, that's a bonus. I didn't expect that. And then I says, so-and-so, some of my classmates and, and my, my, my ball players, their own parents couldn't afford to come watch them play. And if, a, and if an alumni tried to play, pay to get the parent there, it was a violation. Crazy. I said, how come your mom's not here? Well, my grandma, she can't afford it. I just said, we've got to fix that. So I know you all have good intentions. Guys, you've got to help us. If not, we're going to lose something. Well, I think one of the greatest pastimes we've ever had. And no matter where you went to school, no matter if you played or not, you're still there. It's still part of you. And you're rooting for the system, but you're rooting for the kids. And anymore, it's kind of hard to root for the kids when they're starting multimillionaires as a freshman, sophomore. So that's my two cents, Mr. Senate, President, Mr. President, Senate. <laughs> no, Senator Blumenthal has been so kind. We have a lot of the same concerns, and we have a little different opinion of how it should be done. But if you help us, we can make changes. I think we really can. That's going to be constructive. And Mr. Baker, Charlie Baker, my friend, I'm so glad you are where you are. I think you can put basically some common sense to this thing. I don't think we'd have never been there if we had strength of leadership back when this thing evolved to where it got to today. So I'm hoping all of us can work together uh, and uh, take the Take the politics out of it, and I know it's hard to do that anywhere, but if you can take the politics out and be able to look at really what's our purpose, that student athlete should have the best experience in their life to be a basically contributing quality adult to give something back. 98% of them could do that. About 2% will say and make their fortune in the arena. So thank you. Thanks, Senator Manchin. Uh, I have a few uh Closing questions, um, which I'd like to pose to uh, the panel as a whole. Um, some of you may may be aware um, that uh, international students are treated differently than American citizens who are college athletes. Um, I've raised this issue of foreign student athletes being able to benefit from their NIL with Secretary Mayorkas actually in this room before the Judiciary Committee. The current visa system puts those athletes uh, at risk of losing their legal status here if they 
earn any NIL money. In my view, this kind of discrimination is deeply unfair to them and demonstrably outdated. Uh, for example, international students like o Odama Sonogo, uh, a star on the Yukon Huskies basketball team, and uh, a significant part of our victory last year, is totally unable to earn any NIL benefits uh, despite his prowess on the court. These uh, student athletes' diligence, discipline, and determination are equally deserving of monetary reward, in, in my opinion. Let me ask uh, the panel as a whole, maybe beginning with Governor Baker, would you support changes in our laws and regulation to permit those international students who may not be citizens to benefit from their NIL status without fear of losing their visas or other Absolutely. status? Absolutely. Absolutely, yes. 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 Yes, and we actually do contract with international student athletes. Yes. Yes. And just to be clear, Mr. Jones, it's not a question of whether schools would be willing to let them or sponsors would be willing to pay them. It's their status if they accept such payment under our current visa laws. That's what we need to change. So thank you for helping them, but uh, they are still at risk of, of losing their legal status. Yes, I agree. Um, we haven't talked much about enforcement. Um, a former prosecutor, most of my career has been spent in law enforcement, and uh, whatever standards are adopted, whatever reforms are enacted, they will be meaningless unless they are enforced. Uh, the bill, draft bill that Senator Booker and I and Senator Moran have, have written would establish a federally chartered college athletics corporation. It would also give power to the state attorneys general. I happen to be a former state attorney general. I'd like to ask, uh, all of you again, whether you think that kind of independent enforcer is important and whether you have any specific views on who should be doing it. Governor Baker. So I guess I'd say a couple of things. One is um, I think that's a conversation um, we have had and I'm happy to continue to have. I do have some concerns about some of the details and the AGs we should talk about that a little. Um, I've had some interesting experiences with AG since I got this job. And before, probably, too. Yeah, before, too. Yeah. Um, well, I would welcome continuing our conversation about it. Uh, Mr. Petiti? Uh, yeah, I would just need to know more about the structure and, and how it would be set up to really have a strong opinion. I think I initially are more, more inclined to, to try to see if we can figure out a way for the NCA to do this. but. We're open to having those discussions with you. I would also need more information to have an opinion. Uh, it's important that enforcement be conducted by an entity that's independent of the colleges, conferences, and the NCAA. Um, I, I believe the industry wants enforcement when it comes to policing inducements. It can be the same entity that enforces health and safety and other aspects that protect college athletes. I would generally agree with Commissioner Petiti. Um, need more detail and more substance and context, but uh, we're certainly open to uh, oversight and governance for sure. I agree more discussion is warranted. I'm a little bit worried about the lack of enforcement on current state laws, such as NIL laws and uh, laws that exist right now. I'm not sure the states have been very active in enforcing those. I think in increasing the effectiveness of enforcement is, is a critical area that has to be addressed. I'm not sure, I don't have enough detail to respond to that proposal. Well, I, I thank you all for your willingness to talk, but let me just emphasize the real test here is going to be whether the rules are enforced. I mean, the best rules in the world are dead letter unless they're enforced. And uh, I'm certainly more than happy 
to hear from you about how the enforcement should be done, but in my view, independent, effective, well-resourced, and intentional enforcement with an emphasis on independent is key to making this whole system work, not just on NIL, but on health and safety, on scholarships, on medical trust fund, on all the good things that we've agreed are important. And if we are heading now toward the wild, wild west and dangerous chaos with a patchwork of different measures, a national standard on any of these issues will depend on enforceability and, in fact, someone willing to take the reins and make sure that those athletes are really protected. Because we all know that the athletes themselves don't have the resource to go to court. And often, there's a lot of psychological pressure for them to just take it, suck it up, go with the program. And I think uh, Ms. Bodensee is absolutely right that um, state enforcement so far has been lacking. So I would not rely exclusively on state enforcement, whether it's by attorneys general or anyone else. Uh, and I would not rely exclusively on a federal agency. I would allow the athletes themselves to go to court. But I think there has to be some enforcing agency here or entity. Uh, obviously, we're talking about a college athletes corporation, which is not the FTC or an existing government agency, but I'm open to considering one of those enforcement mechanisms as well. I think the other uh, area that uh, Governor Baker has very rightly emphasized is transparency. We need prompt, full, accurate disclosure here. And I think that message has come across from this panel um, very compellingly and forcibly. And I think it is a fact of life that a lot of these uh, very relevant issues need more sunlight, more disclosure, and transparency. And I, I thank you for your willingness to work on that with us. Uh, Mr. Swarbrick, you commented very eloquently on the employee classification issue. The, the panel has seemingly, with unanimity, said no to employee classification, except for uh, Mr. Huma. And I'd like to just ask you to maybe elaborate on the exception that you would make to barring employee status. Sure. And that would be to. Uh you know, really look at equal rights under the law. Uh, but we know we're not talking about high school athletes, Division II, Division Three. We're talking about top football and basketball. That's why the discussion's happening. And it's a realization that those athletes are generating much more revenue that they're receiving in terms of fair pay. Um, there's a lack of protections, workplace protections that are involved as well. Um, and also, to Senator Holly's point, the ability to eventually have some real say and collectively bargain with an industry that is hostile. We're talking about, you know, people are discussing closing the door on employee status without paying the athletes fairly. That hasn't come up in this hearing. And that's at really one of the pivotal points. Um, it's also an issue that I encourage to put to the side because I don't think Congress is gonna actually proactively pay college athletes fairly. Um, I don't think that um, legislation would, would, that would ban college athlete pay would get through either. So there's a lot of issues that we, we, we can, I think, come to agreement on. But I think that that issue is not one of them. So you're talking about it only for some sports and some schools? Correct. And Correct. What, if In, the, what if the athlete didn't want to be an employee? So there, there is, throughout our conversations in all the different states, there was athletes from you know, the NSA's committees or the college's committees that would say, hey, look, I'd rather not have NIL because the school told me uh, that would divert money from our school and force us to cut my sport, and I'm afraid of that. So you got to take it, you have to understand that the athletes said uh, they may truly have a difference of opinion, um, but it shouldn't negate the entire nation 
you know, of right, you know, rights and, and progress for all athletes, you know, whether it be a handful of athletes or groups, what is equal rights under the law? Do athletes have labor rights or not? And I don't think that Congress should be creating special status is what I heard, but it's a second class citizenship. When you carve out players from rights, that's a big issue in this country and uh, we oppose that. I, I think we'll continue to talk about this issue and uh, I'm certainly sympathetic to the idea of collective bargaining. I've been a long-standing champion of unions and the vital role they play in employment settings. And uh, I'd like to continue this conversation with you. I think one of the objectives here is to guarantee fairness and protection to athletes in all schools and all sports. And perhaps that kind of exception makes sense for some colleges and some sports. But uh, I think the line drawing may be difficult to do, but we can continue this conversation. Um, I am grateful to all of you for being here today. It's been a remarkably productive and informative hearing. Each of you has brought a perspective that is singular and extraordinarily significant. And I want to thank all of you. I think that uh, one point that comes across loud and clear is that the present system isn't working. It is broken. And the corrective action taken so far is commendable, but so far inadequate. And that Congress has to do its job to protect student athletes. Thank you all for being here today. Uh, the record will remain open for one week for questions that may be submitted or any additional comments. And we welcome them that you want to add in writing. And with that, the hearing is closed.